It's been a very long time since I've seen that intro. That intro uh, slaps. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Shout out, of course, to Carter Harrell and Cameron Kennedy for bringing the heat on that one. Like always, of course, I'm Tim Geddes, and I'm joined by the sad boy himself, Barrett Courtney. Hello there. Hello there, indeed. And it's Star Wars, so you know that means I had to bring on Pixel Circus's own Sage Ryan. Hello again. And... The master of ceremonies, the master of Star Wars celebrations, if you will. The one and only Anthony Carboni. I am ready for another happy landing, Tim. Yes, <laughs> yes. So here's the thing. This is kind of funny, Star Wars in review. Of course, this is a rewatch. Back in the day leading into episode nine, we ranked, reviewed, and recapped all of the Star Wars theatrically released films. And now we're a couple of years removed from that. The Disney Plus shows are rolling on, uh, and we have... Obi-Wan Kenobi coming out next week. Before we went live, me and Barrett were talking about it. How insane is it that we have a Ewan McGregor-led Obi-Wan Kenobi TV show coming out next week? It feels made up. It feels yeah, made up, really right? Does. I think it's we just like, asked for it for so long and we're so used to not getting the things that we ask for, not like from Star Wars specifically, <laughs> just in general in this life, yeah. uh, that it feels like we asked for it and they said, okay, and we're like, oh wait, hold on, what? Yeah. yeah. I, really? 20 years from now, Somebody is going to do the oral history of this when everybody can talk about what it actually took to make this show happen. Uh, and I am going to be so fascinated to listen to that story. So fascinated. Because yeah. it, it's felt I'm like sure. a long time coming. And I remember it was, I think they announced it officially in this Dis Disney era in 2019. Because I remember it was my first year at KF. We were still in the studio and, you know, they were doing, like, they are building up to a bunch of, like, Star Wars announcements. I forget if it, if it was Star Wars Celebration or if it was, like, the Disney it was content. D, it was D23. I yeah. was there when they announced it. Yeah. And we were, you know, I, I told him, I think it was the day before, of, like, all they need to do is have Ewan McGregor walk out on stage and be like, hey, I once played Obi-Wan. And I'm going to I'm going to play Obi-Wan again. And that's like almost beat for beat what they exactly did. And, you know, I've been riding that high for three years. And, you know, I'm going to continue to ride that high over the next five weeks when the show actually finally comes out. It's insane. Hey, I you, I once played Obi-Wan. Get ready for a life less ordinary two coming to Disney Plus. <laughs> <laughs> it's Damn it. Damn it. It's Damn it. With love too. Are you ready? Please give me a Mulan touche. You know what I mean? <laughs> anyway, that's yeah. all I got for you today. Um, so of course we're doing a rewatch of Star Wars episode three to get in the hype, to get ready for next week, uh, to see the eventual reunion of Darth Vader and Obi-Wan Kenobi. But we had to see where they last left off. Um, so we're gonna do an in review in classic form this is a very exciting in review because it's the very first time that we're having a guest do the plot we're having anthony carboni do the plot of star wars episode three so that's going to be great because this is kind of funnies in review where each and every week we get together to rank review and recap different movie franchises and sometimes we watch ones we've already watched before to get back in that hype train leading into a new project you can watch it on youtube.com slash kind of funny or roosterteeth.com you can also get it as a podcast by searching your favorite podcast service for kind of funny in review and we'll be right there for you if you wanted to get the show ad free and watch live as we record it you got to go to patreon.com slash kind of funny like our patreon producers molecule fargo brady and anonymous have done today we're brought to you by maple story and lumen skin a little housekeeping for you so this is our in review rewatch of episode three starting next week and every week after that until the show's over we're going to be doing our reactions over on the kind of funny screencast um with this group this beautiful group of people uh the rest of kind of funny is invited if anyone would like to join they know that they are welcome but a lot of people are star wars doubt and that's okay that's okay not everybody has to have thoughts on everything right but we have this great group that's going to and i'm very excited about that um we talked about boba fett if you want to get familiar if you aren't already go check out our reviews we did of the whole book of boba fett most of the episodes were all of us um the saddest thing is next week the first two episodes of obi-wan kenobi uh will not be with carboni because he's out there busy hosting stuff at Star Wars Celebration. Are you excited about that, Carboni? I am so hyped. I'm so hyped that we're doing it live again. I'm so hyped to be back on the floor. Uh, and I think it's going to be, with everything that was just announced through Vanity Fair and everything that's brewing, I think it's going to be a very, very interesting year to be at Star Wars Celebration. We'll be doing it every day live on the Star Wars YouTube. So 
Yeah. Very excited. Really cool, really cool stuff. So uh, me, Sage, and Barrett, we will be doing our uh, screencast thoughts, impressions, review, all of that stuff of episodes one and two of Obi-Wan Kenobi next Friday morning. You can check that out. And then following I'll that just every watch week with you and i'll probably just go and like check it out with like you and hayden and then like yeah, no big deal guys yeah, like no big deal. <laughs> do you think you're actually gonna be with them no, no well they keep me a hundred yards away from those people so i don't slobber on them yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably probably for the best they actually um, wrote that in his contract when they signed him uh, uh like hey we need you a hundred yards away from these people so you don't slobber on them yes yeah, slobber it's, a, it's the first time they've had to put slobber in a legal document it's a very mm -hmm. standard slobber clause, as, and it was created for me by Disney. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> Got to make your market Disney, you know? So all of that stuff, we're talking about the future, but let's go to the past. Today, we are talking about Star Wars Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith. It was released on May 19th, 2005. The craziest thing that Barrett brought to my attention is the day this post, this video post, will be the 17 year anniversary. Which we didn't even do day. on purpose. It just kind of <laughs> lined up that way. <laughs> 17 years yeah. of Revenge yeah. of the Sith. I will never forget watching this movie. Uh, me and all my friends legitimately just skipped class. We just cut class in high school, junior year, to go <laughs> watch this thing in I Daily City. And this is like going to out myself as a baby for sure. Uh, but I think this is the only star wars until the new films that i got to see in theaters i think this was the first one i got to see in theaters oh wow as a kid because i would have been like nine turning ten when it came out and that was like yeah. the age, finally i was prime age for episode yeah. three. i was oh, the current yeah. demographic <laughs> yeah i would i would i would have to say so i was eight uh, when this originally came out and my, my dad's side of the family, like lives and <clears throat> breathes Star Wars, even like up to my grandpa, um, you know, uh, wa even watching, uh, the new movies as they were coming out with him and stuff. Um, and so I, I do have very vague memories of seeing episode one and two in theaters, but this was like, I still very much remember this experience of watching it with my dad for the very first time. And, you know, like... <laughs> Him and I, like, even me as a kid, like, un understanding, like, I have fun with these movies. These movies are for kids. Uh, mm -hmm. But even at that age, kind of knowing that, like, you know, the last two movies weren't exceptional by any means. Uh, and him definitely having that understanding. But a lot of, you know, the things that came from this movie, again, not done in an expert way by any uh, means of what they were trying to build to with the story in this trilogy, but it still got us in a lot of ways. Like I, re I remember, you know, my dad kind of tearing up and telling himself out like out audibly, it's going to be okay. You know, uh, <laughs> during the, the pinnacle fight between Obi-Wan and Anakin and stuff like that. And so that's, uh, it, you wasn't. Know, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't <laughs> okay, you. but it ended up being okay. Uh, you know, three, three movies later, uh, at mm -hmm. the end of, uh, return of the jedi so um yeah that like that memory still holds uh, i still hold very dearly of just you know seeing this for the very first time and i probably watched it again with other family members and stuff but yeah that, it was it was wild and i think tim another factoid and i could my dates could be wrong about the uh slightly off about this but i think the tie-in video game star wars episode 3 revenge of the sith uh available on ps2 and xbox uh the original xbox i think that came out before the movie was officially released, alongside, I think, the kids' version of the, like, telling of the book. So I remember, I think, actually starting to read the book before the movie was available. Um, wow, a little I, hipster baby. I know, and, like, that was one of the, because I remember, like, in the book. book was better. Yeah, the book was better. <laughs> uh, like, you know, it describes, like, how, uh, you know, Dooku at the beginning, mm -hmm. when Anakin's about to kill him, like, the the facial expression he makes, uh, makes it seem like he wants to tell Anakin something, and I, I, I'd, like, for whatever reason, that always stuck out to me. Uh, and then, yeah. like actually seeing that moment in in the movie. So just again, so weird. Another little factoid that I sent Tim of like, if we were in the Star Wars timeline, and you know, Revenge of the Sith happened 17 years ago, we'd be three years away from the events of A New Hope, which is also just kind yeah. of freaks me out a little bit. Um, I couldn't get anybody to go see this movie with me. Oh, <laughs> no way! Oh, I was living in New York at the time, and. Um, Everybody was pretty much like, nope, those movies are bad. We're not going to see it. 
Uh, and so I, uh, I went before work, I went on my own to go see <laughs> Revenge of the Sith because I couldn't get any of my cool New York friends to go see a lame Star Wars movie with me. <laughs> I'd like to think I speak for all of us when I say, uh, we would have gone with you, bud. Oh, yes. yeah. Oh, yes. We knew you. I'm happy, We'd have I'm been happy there. you have, have these type of cool friends now. You know what I mean? You got yeah, us. For sure. We got you on the right <laughs> side of things. Um, this one had a runtime of two hours and 20 minutes. It was directed and written by George Lucas. The music, of course, was done by John Williams. And like, let's just let's just talk about it for a second. You can say what you will about the prequels. The score is debatably better than the originals. Like, it's just owns. so damn fire, man. Yeah. The score. The score is just lifts these movies on its shoulders. It really does in a lot of places. Uh, The budget of this one was 113 million and the box office was 868.4 million. The highest grossing film in the U S and the second highest grossing film worldwide back in 2005. Obviously now it's a lot lower. And it it Um, did from what I remember. It did 200 million more than episode two. Wow. People who people who were like, oh, I don't want to see episode two or like I heard it's not that great. And episode one wasn't that great. They came back to see Darth Vader happen. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they yeah. wanted to oh. see this. And you had to see it. This was yeah. the thing. With that, this was uh, again, correct me if I'm wrong. This was the first PG-13 Star Wars, correct? Because all of them. Had yeah, been I think PG so. Previously. Yeah. And, and let, boy, yeah. did they push that to the furthest extent. <laughs> oh, they got my that God. Race, they earned it. <laughs> Yes, yes, they did. Let, let's start off with our impressions of this of this rewatch of Star Wars Episode Three. Sage, what did you think? I really enjoyed the film. Uh, it was more violent than I remembered, which is very funny because it's been a hot minute since I've watched Episode Three. I've started prequel rewatches a good few times, so I've watched one and two more times than I've actually watched Episode Three. Uh, and immediately, I was reminded that they really committed to that PG thirteen. Um, I enjoyed the characters very much i had a lot of fun watching it it was simultaneously better and worse than i remembered in many ways there were areas where i was like wow i remember this being a lot cooler and then there are areas that are just like wow i remembered her having more lines uh (laughs) okay (laughs) got it yeah that's my like Uh, like light overview of where i'm at with it carboni i love this one I want to say shout out to the MVP, Ian McDermott, who just destroys. This movie is just a McDermott movie. I know what it's (laughs) supposed to be about. I know who we're supposed to care about. But this is the Chancellor on Ice. This is the (laughs) Chancellor the Musical. This is the one-man show Chancellor exclamation point live. I do every one man show. This film. <laughs> I love this film because McDermott is just the MVP. But also, like, I think time has been time has been kinder to these movies than we thought, particularly with uh particularly with, of course, the Clone Wars and all of the things that uh Dave Filoni and the rest of the uh the television team has done, the comic book team, to sort of fill in some things that give these movies a bit more gravitas than I think they had upon first viewing. And I, and I love that. I love that now I can go back and I can be like, as a standalone film, there are some things in here where I'm like, why, is, why are these people acting like this? But with the Clone Wars added in, I'm like, it was explained. I'm fine. Get to the Chancellor. <laughs> 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 Barrett. Um, yeah, you know, it's 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 always fun to go back to this uh, because, you know, I'm an insane person. I think it was like about a year ago where I took six months to do a timeline order rewatch of not just the, uh, the movies, but also include uh, all the shows, uh, comics, most a good amount of the books, the video games that are in the current Disney canon uh, for Star Wars. And something that I kind of realized when I started it all with like, from going from Phantom Menace to Attack of the Clones to Clone Wars to this movie is that like I don't really see the prequels as the trilogy of movies like I see the prequels as the Clone Wars show that happens to have these kind of like book ended events um, at, the, at, at the beginning and the end and like Carboni was saying like the you know particularly Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith I think you know 
you know, when it comes to, you know, acting and, you know, plot points specifically within those movies, not everything holds up, but there are ideas there that looking back, you, you know that like Lucas still had the sauce in a way, you know, we say this on PS, I love you a lot. Like, do you have the sauce to be telling the story that you're trying to tell? And he did have that aspect in there. Maybe, you know, looking back on it, maybe it's not something that he should have aspired to do in just three movies. Maybe it's something that he should have tried to tell with, with you know, with a bigger team than just himself and a bunch of yes men. Um, you know, like there was there was something there that was special. And I, I, I think that's, uh, you know, it really shows, I think, watching this movie with the full context of, you know, uh, the character's journey as told in the Clone Wars show. And, you know. I've kind of talked about it on uh, social media. Uh, I watched the four-hour fan supercut of this, which um, added in, you know, it's the the full Revenge of the Sith movie with uh, some deleted scenes, um, some of the 2D Clone Wars episodes that details okay. Grievous's capture of uh, Palpatine that we see at the very beginning of the movie, and then also bringing in the Siege of Mandalore um, uh, final arc in the Clone Wars. And, you know, it, it starts off with, like, the, the first episode of Siege of Mandalore where, you know, it's like the Anakin and Obi-Wan in the middle of a battle. And, you know, they're they're doing their jokes and they're, they're having the fun back and forth. And it kind of, like, starts from there. And, uh, you know, this fan who made this, like, uh, tried their best to, like, make it as, like, uh, timeline order specific as possible while also, like, still including, like, cuts and fadeaways that still feel very, like, Lucas-esque edited and stuff like that. You went and, hard, dude. Yeah. Aiden. Um, you went hard, and I love this. <laughs> and I even rewatched some of the uh, some Clone Wars episodes before uh, watching this just to get, like, the lead-in of, you know, where Ahsoka is at and stuff like that. And while, you know, this was, like, a fun thing to experience, right, like, it, it was... It was really just fun. It, it, I don't know if it like watching it this way really added anything for me personally, but it was fun to see like you know the you know the, the moment where Anakin walks into the uh, Palpatine's uh, room right and um, you know uh, Mace Windu's got him cornered, and then it cuts back to Darth Maul opening his eyes while he's captured because he feels you know, this moment that he had a dream about, a premonition about, like, it's about to happen, you know, in the same vein of when Anakin decides to betray uh, Mace, and then you mm -hmm. see Ahsoka's reaction to that, like, cut to immediately. Like, uh, that was pretty cool um, to just kind of, like, <laughs> get the, you know, get the full ramifications of these core characters uh, from the shows and stuff. So, um, yeah, and it was the one thing I remember texting Tim about was, like, it's so funny, like, when you're in, like, the beginning parts of it, because the first shot of the movie isn't until 45 mm -hmm. minutes into this cut. Um, and you get the detailed kind of Grievous capturing uh, uh, Palpatine, and it's, like, the 2D 2005 animated show that, like, led into the release of this movie. And, you know, it's very cartoony. It's definitely 17 years old with, like, the, mm -hmm. you know, the... the it's perfect. Uh, the creator of Samurai Jack, I, I believe, who, who worked on that. And yep. it's so cartoony. And you're like, man, this is really cartoony. And then you get to the beginning of the actual Revenge of the Sith movie, and you're like, oh, this is also kind of really cartoony. Like, it weirdly, they, like, um, tonally weirdly still fit together, which is... I thought was fascinating so um yeah i i still really love this movie i i loved it as a kid and you know over time i, I my appreciation of it has grown and grown we can dip uh, we can dip into your we can dip into your new encyclopedic four-hour cut knowledge when we when <laughs> when we're trying to explain some of these motivations away yeah <laughs> yeah that, that is 100 percent what it is i also uh put it upon myself to watch the four and a half hour cut you did it uh, more so because I I, been, pressured him I have it. not seen the original uh, Clone Wars cartoon since it came out. Where was the like... Dropbox links for your bud? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the two of us were out here See, like, here's the thing. Did I, I didn't we want to like, put it on you guys. You yeah, know? we did not want to put it on anybody. And like, honestly, it's one of those things where I had a lot of fun watching it. I don't even know that it is like the recommended way to watch it. <laughs> I think it enhances a lot. Like the biggest problem I had is to bear its point, like the first 45 minutes are 
just uh, Clone Wars 2D, Clone Wars 3D. And the whole time I'm like, no, this movie's not that bad. I was wrong. And then the live action movie starts. I was like, you know what? This movie's not that good. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> wow. So I, I, I enjoyed it a lot. I think that, you know, it's it. we all understand what Filoni has done, what the, the rest mm-hmm. of the teams have done. They have expanded and they, they took what was and they built upon it and they enhanced it and it did make it better in a lot of ways. And there's no taking that away. Those are all facts. That's all out there. But Talking about just episode... Movie. What's up? I said, but this is also a good movie. Go on, go, continue this, with your this, thing. And I think, I think, Carboni, continue we're going to have a lot. We're going to have a lot <laughs> of uh, flashbacks to our Spider Boys doing the the Spider Man rewatches of the yeah. early Spider Man movies, where it's like, I I do not think that they're good movies, but like, I'll be damned if I don't have a fun time watching. Listen, it's I'm like, lo- I, I'm Lord I for today, movie. and I am impartial, and I simply I simply <laughs> I go with the wind as he's yes, in the background going, yes. and they're very good movies, but it's also very good. <laughs> <laughs> but that, 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 it's funny because like Sage was talking about this earlier. It's like, you know, it this movie I think is better and worse than you remember it being in some ways. Like I remember for a long time growing up um, and before like I was on podcast talking about this professionally, <laughs> whatever that is. And I would defend episode three being like, no, 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 no. Three's good though. Three's good. It's not like two. It's not like one. Three's actually good. And I'm like rewatching it now. I'm like, it, oh man, I was fighting a fight that I didn't actually even really stand by at that point just because it's not as bad as people say that it is and i think that now we're at a point post the sequel trilogy post a lot of things where we've had some time to kind of take in star wars for what it is overall and i think that looking at these movies for what they are i obviously have a fondness for the prequels like i was nine years old when episode one came out i fucking love pod racing anytime pod racing gets brought up i'm gonna be a happy boy and all i wanted when i walked out of that theater was to see Anakin turned into Darth Vader. We knew it was going to happen. And this movie delivered that shit. It also delivered us a lot of things that didn't really make sense. And so much cool shit that they don't show on screen that thankfully things like Clone Wars do show on screen Mm -hmm. um, and kind of build up to. But this movie in particular, I think, is kind of... uh, Better than it it was given credit for, but also worse than people do give it credit for. And it just mm-hmm. kind of is this fun thing that I can't wait to see what we get next week with the, the Obi Wan series. It's I mean yes, it, piece of art. <laughs> those are a <laughs> lot of words. Those there are, are layers. There are layers. <laughs> But it's it's undeniable that the the prequel trilogy is a very special set of movies that um, have a lot of joy in them. And mm-hmm. whether I'm enjoying watching them because of how bad they are or because of um, how good they are, I'm firmly on the bad side. But I have a lot of fun, and you can't take that away from me. So with that, I want to get to our, our sponsors real quick. But when we get back, Caboni is going to start the plot. Shout out to MapleStory for sponsoring this episode. Are you tired of being judged based on the way you look? MapleStory is too. Because while it may look cute and cuddly, this is a deeply hardcore MMORPG. MapleStory is full of vast colorful lands and a ferocious array of towering monsters and don't get us started about damage. MapleStory will have you dealing billions with each swing of your Fafnir battle cleaver as you battle boss after epic boss and you can customize your mapler your way maple story has 40 plus jobs and thousands of weapons outfits hats armor sets and mounts for you to take on your journey from the lionheart battle bracers to vicious lollipop wands and you know i love a lollipop wand there's a ton to see and do in this picturesque world and with 18 years of content to sink your genesis weapon into there will always be a new adventure around the corner maple story is ready to go Are you? You can go to maplestory.com to check out the game and play for free. That's free, guys. Come on. Maplestory.com. This episode is brought to you by Lumen. If your skincare routine is basically you washing your face in the shower with that one shower gel that you've been using since high school, then it's time to level up the skincare game. Thanks to Lumen, you can drop that bottle of three-in-one and start using products that actually take care of your face. With Lumen, you get the highest quality products. All their products aim to help with those stubborn acne scars, under eye dark circles, wrinkles, sun damage, dry skin, oily skin. Gia has been using the charcoal face wash and charcoal face scrub and she feels so fresh so clean afterward she has dry skin so especially during the winter it's nice to have that hydration and exfoliation also she's a big fan of the really subtle citrus smell all you have to do is take a two minute quiz on their website and they'll tell you exactly which routine is best for you based on your skincare needs level up your skincare game with lumen skin today you can go to lumenskin.com slash kind of funny to get your free trial of lumen's products that's l-u-m-i-n-s-k-i-n.com 
lumenskin.com slash kind of funny to get your free trial of Lumen's products. Lumenskin.com slash kind of funny. Carboni? The floor is War! Yours. War! <laughs> <laughs> this is one of my favorite. Uh, listen, out of all the crawls, I have to say my two favorites are crawls from probably two movies that people do not love the most. I love this, and I love the crawl from Skywalker, where it just starts with the dead speak. No, see, yes. this is that's a I good crawl. Carboni. Look, you say what you will about the movie. You're watching. You're, it comes up on the screen. The dead speak. Fuck, yeah. that's a good start. Now, no, where does it go from start. there? Where does it go from there? That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking okay. about is war. Yeah. The Republic is crumbling under attacks from the ruthless Sith Lord Count Dooku. There are heroes on both sides. Both sides what? need to be listened to. <laughs> I feel like nope. the, no, it's there's nope. villains on both sides. Yes, that is no. true. Nope. The problem is that there are not good people on both sides. <laughs> there are um, not good people on either side. <laughs> <laughs> but it does say evil is everywhere. Now, uh, this this starts off with I think this is a beautiful opening that kind of shows to me how far, just within the space of these prequels the technology came from episode one to episode three. Um, seeing, the, seeing the star destroyers and the star fighters floating over the, floating over the planet, it all looked so much better to me than episode one did. And you can really see these movies were basically a big experiment by George Lucas to be like, can I make an entire movie inside a computer? Can anybody do that? And I think by the time they got to episode three, I think this. I think this entire opening sequence looks beautiful, um, dude. I, I think. I think it's more than just the the technical look of it. I think it is the the lore and story kind of ideas of the ship designs um, changing, and hopefully Carboni comes back. Uh, but of the ship designs, I, I'm a sucker in Star Wars for kind of getting the the cross era uh, progression that we see and seeing the kind of like ship designs from the good and bad sides kind of flip into the Empire um, yeah. on this and like the Star Destroyer shape and stuff is the good guy ship in this but like that stuff's really cool to me but I think that this opening a Star Wars movie in the star fight like yeah. in the the like the like we're in space and this is normally the last third of the movie but boom we're starting with it was oh, wait, I think a bold uh, it was a uh, exactly it was a bold call and I think that it's one of this movie's strongest points like it was really well choreographed and having Anakin uh like get all the buzz droids off of the other ship and like using his ship like droids. all that stuff I'm like this is really great for character development for them and it's kind of a thrilling action scene and to Carboni's point it looks cool so it looks I great. I thought the opening of this movie was really yeah. Rad. The buzz droids are one of those beautiful Star Wars things that make no sense. <laughs> like, I love them because it's like, we're not going to shoot your ship down with an explosive or concussive blast. What we're going to do is we're going to shoot you with something that opens up into a bunch of tinier little things that slowly, <laughs> that slowly cut you apart into tiny little pieces. And I'm just like, yes. Yes, to this. I love it. <laughs> well, there's gotta uh, be a solution when you can't shoot these like really talented Jedi fighters down. You gotta, you gotta figure <laughs> out something, and it, you, you just like you just you know shotgun blast all of these uh, little uh, uh, droids that look kind of cute in the right context, kind uh, of adorable. Yeah, there are a lot of evil droids in the prequels that are actually very adorable. <laughs> so um, true. Now, this of course we sh we see uh, Obi Wan and Anakin in their ETA two starfighters, which are some of my favorite ships, the little Flash Gordon space pods that they fly through. Um, and this also, to me, is a really great. I think Revenge of the Sith might be. It's up in the most quotable movies of all Star Wars movies. It really is just the just the back and forth between Anakin and Obi Wan. There are so many good one liners in this. And I forgot how many of them just come right out of this first five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> just the, just everything. The flying is for droids. All of the good stuff uh, comes here. And I, I love, I just love that this is where we kind of get to see Anakin and Obi-Wan. And we only really get this friendship pre-Clone Wars series. This banter is what we get in this movie. Yeah. This opening yeah. sequence is what we get. It, it, it's very reminiscent of the, 
you know, it, again, it's uh, almost blanket and you miss it kind of thing from Attack of the Clones when they're in the elevator, right? And mm -hmm. where you see Ewan McGregor bring that energy with like what little he's given to have the fun, quippy back and forth with his Padawan. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, now, and, which is great. And it's unfortunate too, because it's like, they're like, all right, we're going to have quips and like a fun brotherly love at the very beginning of this movie for 30 seconds. And then we're going to completely forget about it for the rest of the movie. <laughs> I think there's yeah. one other point where it comes up and I'll reference it when we get to it. But I do think that there is one other moment that I think is crucial to their relationship uh, that highlights the way that Obi-Wan believes in Anakin, which I think is very important to the direction this goes. And yeah. like what a pillar of um, belief that he's been the whole time and also like support for Anakin's self-esteem that he is. Yeah, that comes up a little bit later. I, I, I think I know the part that you're talking about. So. Uh, they are, of course, uh, flying towards Grievous's ship, the Invisible Hand. Uh, the Invisible Hand, I love as a name because, of course, it references Palpatine. It references it references Sidious. It also references. It's an economics term for capitalism, and this whole thing is about <laughs> trade disputes and economics. So I love that. Yeah. And also, how many people lose hands in Star Wars? This is a good name for a ship. <laughs> yeah, they yeah. really went into that. <laughs> um, so they uh, they get they get down onto the ship. R two is of course there with them. We get our first just bad flipping feeling. around. Just, He's flipping, just around. flipping around on things, you know. <laughs> uh, we get our first bad feeling. Uh, we get our first battle droids. Of course, Matt Wood is the voice of the battle droids, and I just I love the battle droids. They make me so happy. I'm a sucker for them. Again, it's the nostalgia little kid shit. But like, I mm -hmm. I have an, an intense episode one nostalgia. So seeing the battle droids, seeing the gun rays, like all that stuff, like. Mm -hmm. I'll go as far as saying it. Seeing Jar Jar Binks is a fucking senator. You know what I mean? <laughs> so good. So good. He got every and even, um, even the super battle droids too. And again, this is like in that moment, like going from the 2D and 3D uh, animated shows where they're, they are a little more uh, willing to be uh, as goofy as they want for kids and stuff like that. Or, you know, constantly in those shows, right? They're, they're making like dumb little uh, jokes that make you chuckle for a second. And then they still have that same level of energy when the two like super battle droids come in and they're like looking at the Jedi fighters and they kind of hear R2 and like that whole slapstick stuff is fantastic. It goes on for so long and I love <laughs> so it. Long. It's just like, nah, probably didn't hear anything. Still didn't hear anything. Um, the other scene that absolutely shook me in this, specifically with R2, is him like pouring out the oil and then just lighting that other droid on fire. It's ridiculous. There's I a was real. Just like, what the hell? Where did this come from? There's a real dark streak in this one, and it's it 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 it's a little whiplash at times. I don't mind saying it, uh, but of course. They've landed on the Ven uh, on the Venator Starcraft, and they are trying to get to the Chancellor. Uh, they talk a little bit outside of the elevator about what they're going to do. What is this? It's a trap. What do we do? Spring the trap. Very Obi Wan. Mm -hmm. um, this sequence, the rescue of Palpatine, was originally in the cut in the original cut of the movie an hour long. There was a oh, lot wow. that was cut from this. And I buy that because it makes little to no sense without like rewatching it a couple times and really mm -hmm. kind of getting into it. Cause like, I think episode three uh, does a disservice to a lot of people where this is one of the earliest examples in, in star Wars or in any of these kind of big um, IP movies where, Oh, Hey, Grievous is here now. Who the fuck is Grievous? What the fuck are you talking about? Tim, you and had it, to I watch like the 2d animated clone Wars show to understand. Okay. That's the point that I'm making is that like that, it was such a different time where to see that you needed access to cartoon network, right? Like that is yeah. not something that is like Disney plus where everyone just kind of, where Disney assumes you, right. you have access, you're able to see this. They were just like, fuck it. It doesn't matter. We're just going to drop people into this scenario where in one ship, we're going to have multiple people that you know that the audience knows are bad guys. And mm -hmm. we're also going to like the gunray people from episode one, but we're also going to have the um, Palpatine, clearly the emperor. And we're also going to have Dooku, the bad guy from the last movie. Oh, mm -hmm. and then there's this fucking robot who's coughing for some reason. It's like, it's really, really jarring. So I am not yeah. surprised that there's a lot of shit cut. Yeah. And, and I think as far as like, as far as the introduction or non-introduction of Grievous goes, look, this dude's got Palpatine. It said war in the crawl. General Grievous <laughs> has him. Oh, okay. That must be General Grievous. I love his weird limping chicken run that he does. Grievous <laughs> never walks. He's always like doing that. <laughs> like, I, 
I just he's such a weird little movie monster like Lon like Lon Chaney of a guy, and I freaking love it. Um, going up through the elevator, this is where one of the first big cuts happens. There is a lot more discussion between Obi Wan and Anakin in the original cut, and there's a lot more showing of sort of the trust and the friendship between the two of them. Also, when they get off the elevator in the original cut, they don't run into this ray shield, which is what they're about to run into. They run into General Grievous with Shock T captured on her knees in front of them, and Grievous straight up kills Shock T in front of Whoa. them. Whoa. And it's pretty graphic, and I imagine it's one of the things that they had to cut to get their PG-13. Yeah. But that's also, but you also in the in that original cut got this. Grievous opening up his his robe and showing all of the lightsabers and taking shock tees and putting it in and is like I look forward to getting yours yes. and it's like cool like, yeah right. <laughs> yes. and it's funny of like how they were thinking about that again not to keep bringing up this 2D 2005 animated show but she's the one pursuing Grievous while he's trying to like uh, capture uh, Palpatine so that's yes. like. It's so interesting. I'm like, how? I'll tell you what. There are more. There are two more uh, cut scenes where Shakti dies. <laughs> <laughs> they Why could not fi- killing Shakti. <laughs> they could not figure out where to put the death of Shakti. Uh, but what I love. So we show as they're going up through the elevator. Uh, we get a lot of the Obi Wan is not good with technology. He's not good or trusting of droids. Anakin's still like, hey, shut your mouth. Droids rule. Um, we still see a lot of Anakin. Being if even if he is straying, he is fiercely protective of his friends to a fault. Even at this point, which of course, it really is going to get to a fault. Um, yeah. Well, I don't know if he becomes fiercely protective of his friends to a fault. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> um. So we get to the point where they see uh, Chancellor Palpatine. Oh no, I'm caught. Oh, save me. Oh no. I fucking love this so much. <laughs> Bro, this point when he's just talking and keeps switching into his fucking Palpatine voice is so funny. How he'll just be like, I'm talking normal. I'm talking normal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, of course, we see Count Dooku comes down. Of course, it is like, yo, what's up? This is where we get one of my favorite, favorite lines, which is, of course, my powers have doubled. Mm-hmm. Since we've last met, how do you, how do you quantify that? But I love it. I, of course. The mouth on this kid. Uh, but I also He's love more midichlorians <laughs> since you know episode. Two. Oh, is that how they? I'm sure that's how mm-hmm. they work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the my just, my other favorite thing. thing <laughs> I'm sorry. My other favorite thing is when uh, be careful, Count Dooku is here. Uh, you can't stop him. He's a Sith Lord. And Obi Wan being like, wink. Sith Lords are our specialty. Are they my guy? <laughs> Are they? Would he you know one that, if though. you saw one? <laughs> yeah, he does exactly. Say that. He says speciality. He had so many speciality. <laughs> so much to it. I love everyone's choices. I talk about space British all the time. As someone who plays Princess Leia in a D&D game every week, I love to talk about space British. Ewan McGregor, on the other hand, did not adapt everyone else's space British. He did completely his own thing. He made up an entirely new dialect for Obi-Wan, and it's my favorite of it's anyone's perfect, speech in it this. Because it, it, it just, like, it really shows of just, like, how much of just, like, over-the-top Obi-Wan is all the time. Committed. Yeah. So good. Great. So my note to add to this scene is why did Anakin always look like a villain? Oh, just they never dressed up. him like a Jedi. They never did his hair or makeup like a Jedi. Like they very intentionally are like villain signaling the entire time with adult Anakin. And I just don't understand why. Like, yes, we know he's going to be Darth Vader. And I get that this is for children and you have to let them know. But like, damn, you could have given us just like a little more cover up. Like you could have put him in the, the Jedi robes. The, the hair, like his hair is greasy from the go. Hair, the he's scar. like, he's got the scar, but also nobody else is allowed to wear anything but the white and tan. Even Mace Windu, who's allowed to have a purple <laughs> lightsaber. Right. Yeah, which is which <laughs> is just amazing. I mean, like the thing is, like I I, I know that this crowd's uh, views on Luke are are different than mine in many ways. But uh, in Return of the Jedi, him wearing black, I loved that. It felt different. It felt like we're getting kind of some some hints of some things that could be potentially, and the story kind of deals with it. But to Sage's point in this, it really just is, y'all. He's a bad guy, motherfucker. Right. It's like, oh, I... hey, oh, 
are we going to let the kid that everyone was like kind of worried about the whole prophecy and all that stuff, we're just going to let him go through his emo phase in front of us? I feel like the adults would have been like, nah. And I guess to an extent they do. They, I guess the Jedi Council yeah. is trying to put him in his place. But, but again, the whole point, and uh, 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 like I'll go back to like, Lucas had the ideas here when he was first making these movies. Was he the sole person who should have been telling these stories and writing these scripts? No. But, you know, part of the thing that I don't think, like, a lot of people talk about is that, like, he was trying to make the point of, like, yo, the Jedi Order checked the fuck out, guys. Like, yeah. they yes. don't give a shit. And that's why, you know, they let this this guy turn into the way he, he is, man. It's because yeah. they're, they're not... I Great yeah. Jedi, Jedi, not supportive, not supportive to youngsters, as we'll see in this. They, they're not. They're, it's not a supportive work environment. There's no compliment sandwiching when you're a Jedi, and I think we'll see this throughout. Uh, but one thing that I do want to say about this, a word that keeps coming that popped into my head every time I watch this is Shakespearean. It's Shakespearean. There is so much. Everything from every like it feels the your bad guys feel like your Iagos and Falstaffs. The the dialogue between the two young lovers is like when it works is kind of like very Shakespearean. Does it work a lot? I'm not here to say what I'm here to say is when it works, it's very Shakespearean. And one of the things that I love is during this fight with, with uh, digital Dooku, who by the way, walked so every Marvel movie could run like in all honesty, this still looks pretty good. Like, you know, it's not Christopher Lee, but I'm like, Yo, this is how this is how Paul Rudd does Ant Man. You know what I mean? Like this is how these these guys are doing these movies. Um, See, I don't know that I can say this shit looks good. I think that some of the ship stuff, I stand by it looks great, mm -hmm. but I think that a lot of the it's it's less the choreography and it's more the way the humans move in this. Like uh, a, a scene that comes to mind for me is in this when the rubble is kind of thrown down on Obi Wan. Like mm -hmm. the way that it is animated is. It, it's not lifelike and it's also not cartoony it creates this really kind of weird thing where no matter what it is you're like that man is crippled for life yeah like, like i don't care that he's a jedi in the he is split yeah. in two man yeah. and i feel like a they lot rag of fighting, real hard they ragdoll it, like an xbox the ragdoll <laughs> shit i think kind of like uh seeing christopher lee like move around the way he does it just it doesn't feel believable even knowing they have special powers that make anything happen like it, it right. just doesn't like add up to me visually i i didn't have i didn't have that same problem i would say you know obviously the effects are not as good as as we've got now but i think one of the other things that i liked is they were learning to edit for the effects too like they weren't so this has to be a perfectly clear shot of a digital person all the time they started cutting it a little bit more like a like a fight scene in this but to talk about this shakespearean stuff all these little all these little things from 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 Palpatine, the do it, do it, which is my favorite thing. Kill him, kill him now. Like, oh, I Everyone love talks Palpatine. About the do it, and not do enough it. people talk about get. get. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that they just left in him doing that, yeah. and like I watch everything with closed captions because I can't, I can't watch a movie without it. Um, and the fact that it literally just says get across the bottom of the, with no, he doesn't finish the sentence. There isn't nope. anything. He just goes from like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, get. And then they just cut back to the fight is the funniest thing I've ever seen in a film ever. No, you're so uh, right. And I I love this scene. I like, like just legitimately, cool. I love it because it just, it brings me joy. Like this, this scene to me is kind of the perfect example of why I enjoy this movie as much as I do, because it has those ridiculous moments. It's also pretty damn cool. And we get the scene of like Anakin force pulling the other lightsaber and then doing the cross-handed dual decapitation. It's one of those, one of the coolest things I've ever seen in a movie ever. And I know that it's ridiculous. And I know that it was just a little, a little kid being like, and, and then the toys do this. And then, then he's decapitated, <laughs> but they just, they had the balls to do it. They yeah, leads back into the Star Wars camp, man, which is what and, they needed to be doing. And this, like, because, because the shock T part was cut, this is the first moment where you watch this and you're like, oh, we're going down a road. Uh -huh. This is very different. Um, you know, obviously Obi-Wan comes back, he sees, you know, he's about to see what happens, but when he frees the, when he frees the chancellor here and the chancellor is giving like his first talk where he's like, Hey, look, it's only natural. You cut off your arm. You wanted revenge. Remember what you told me about your mother and the Sam? This is, this is like grooming. 
This is yeah. the groomingest of grooming. He's like, hey man, no, I get it. You were angry and you flew, you flew out of line. Remember that thing that you told me in confidence that only I know about what you did to those people? I understand it. I'll never tell anyone, but remember that I do know and I could. You know what I mean? Like this, Proper villains. this, this is very good. And McDermott plays it very, very well. Um, I do also like this moment here, even though the kid is dressed in black and decapitating people. The thing about Obi-Wan where um, his fate will be the same as ours. We're not going to leave him behind. This is my friend. I do still care. I, I'm already starting to get me mixed up in the head, but at this point, I still do remember to, that why I started doing this was to protect the people that I love. Um, R2's wild-ass side adventures. <laughs> Great. Absolutely. 100% just the best R2 side adventures you could ask for. Because while this is happening, it, we've got the stuff going on that we were talking about where He's literally uh, immolating droids and like trying to feel like trying to hide when we see him, they get caught in the ray shield and, and it's like, don't worry. I say patience. R2 will, R2 is still out there and R2 just comes slamming like, Oh no. And I'm like, <laughs> this is a good comedic moment. <laughs> yeah. I actually though. love this moment. Um, I R2 think will R2 save us both. Balance there, right? Yeah. Especially because Anakin is such like a like a pissy boy through all of this. <laughs> the, his like softness for R two, I think, is so important. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're, we're, he, I, I do too. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, just just real quick, I was just gonna say it's like I I think that uh, one of the bigger problems, one of the bigger problems of the prequels is their commitment to going back and being like, hey, remember C three PO? Well, Anakin actually built him, and R two's been there the whole time, and oh, Chewbacca's gonna hang out. We'll get to that in a second. Like all that type of stuff, I think. Like while of course creates the fan service hype moments uh, in theaters and stuff, creates problems where all of a sudden they are creating new character uh, like traits of these characters yeah. that we know that they then need to double down on so getting this like goofy r2 that we had a goofy r2 in the original trilogy but it was a saucier r2 as opposed to like goofy kind of weird shenanigans that i think we get in, introduced to mainly in attack of the clones yeah. where he's like jet setting around you know and the opening of this movie feels like they're doubling down on that like well it's because r2's like that it's like well y'all made him like that and he wasn't before <laughs> yeah, the the Metroiding, the sort of Samus Erroning of R2, where somewhere between the first trilogy and the second trilogy, he loses all his weapons and stuff yep. is a little interesting. Uh, that you know, they, that's something that they do talk about a little bit where where um, as time goes by, uh, the, the maintenance that's done on R2 is less. Some of that uh, functionality is taken away or it doesn't work anymore. R2 is also like trying to keep a low profile at that point like there's a lot of stuff that goes on to explain it but you're right there does become the weight where it needs to be explained yeah um, i will say i think i'm okay with him having a little bit of a you're not my dad energy though mm -hmm. you know what i mean like anakin was his boy anakin yeah. built him and that bond never quite forms even between him and luke uh because like as much as it was passed down and now he was luke's droid like he wasn't luke's droid right, right. So the relationship that they have is not the same and the things that he has been through and the things that he has seen through it, even though there's not necessarily supposed to be like emotions necessarily, I think that changes over time and I'm okay with it. Um, they are taken prisoner, of course, by Grievous. They decide that they're going to, they're going to go to the bridge with him. Um, one of my favorite things that I love is as they're brought into the bridge to face Grievous, one of the battle droids like walks by and goes, excuse me. Like bumps against, like bumps against Obi Wan and but just it's goes. Also, excuse it's me. not like a like a just a very flat. Excuse me. It's like excuse me. Like uh, I'm walking here. Come yeah. on. Don't you see me? I'm a droid. I exist here, and you're just gonna bump into me like that. Like it's such. Yeah. A, it's just a specific level of sassiness where it's like, hell yeah, I love these droids, and I need an entire show about just I the sassiness the of these droids. So um, we also get introduced to uh the the IG-100 Magna Guards. Those are the droids that wear very cool torn capes and have, oh, so uh, and have, cool. the, electric, uh, have the electric staffs. Um, they are mostly used as Grievous's personal guard. Uh, you don't see them much uh, outside of that, but they're some of my favorites. I love them so much. 
Uh, I and they're like... all over the the 2D Clone Wars, which mm -hmm. I mean, I just need to say it. Like, y'all, watch this shit. Like, if it's been a while or if you've never seen it before, watch it. It is so damn cool. I would argue it is cooler now than it was then. Like, it's fucking oh. awesome. Gendy Tartakovsky destroyed with that. It's it's absolutely unbelievable. The the Mace Windu episode of it is cool. Um, the the big the big bat, uh, duel. But anyway, um, General Grievous, you're shorter than I expected. I that's good. It's good. It's Star Wars. Uh, hey, yeah, it's good. good. But, you know, there is, to me, there is a little, a lot of people die in this movie, which does not happen as much in Star Wars. And a lot of people make jokes immediately after people dying, which is a little weird. Yeah. Uh, it is Star Wars, but that to me is like the weirdest bits is like the yeah. quipping immediately after somebody dies. He doesn't but know how to transition in between those like uh, those darker moments and the, the quippy things. I do want to, you know, uh, just shout out, you know, because I think someone in the, the Patreon comments already uh, said this of because of this very short interaction where it's implied of like Anakin and Grievous have not met each other whatsoever during uh, this war. Throughout the entire run of the Clone Wars show, which is seven seasons, Anakin and Grievous never interact with each other in an episode. They, they make sure, even if they're in the same episode, that they never actually cross paths. Which they, is meet, like, they meet one time at a masquerade ball, but they're both in costume. <laughs> yeah, they didn't know. And they so didn't they know. didn't know. And they actually, like, they actually found out that they got along really well and like they have a lot in it. common. Yeah, they kissed a little bit, but uh, yeah. they didn't know. They they never knew. <laughs> uh, if he can cough, he can kiss. That's it's what they say. Motto. That's what my doctor always says. If you can cough, you can kiss. What? He's General not a great Grievous doctor. Coughs. He's why does a droid cough? <laughs> Uh, I hate because it. well, there's a whole thing to grieve. Yeah, he wasn't course, always a droid man. He was. You I know. know, but he is made of droid parts now. <laughs> He's made of droid and and just the most tired eyes you've ever seen. He just shouldn't needs, cough. This needs one nap, Grievous. Um, this fight in in the bridge of the Invisible Hand, I really love. I like watching the the Magna Guards fight. I like watching uh the fact that Obi Wan and and Anakin sort of just planned for oh well. We'll get more sabers. Things will happen. We're going to get our way out of this. We'll improvise. Uh, All the gravity but, stuff. Like, I'm a sucker for gravity stuff. And oh. I thought it was done really well in this. Like, this, th they did a good job with the pacing of the opening of this movie going from the, the starfight scene to into the ship to then this action scene. Like, it kind of feels like, oh, man, you're already giving us another one? Like, thank you. This is pretty damn cool. Yeah, and Grievous uh, taking out the taking out the 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 windshield the starship windshield of his own ship to take out these jedi is such a power move and i love it so much and it really sets the tone for this for grievous for this new villain that we're meeting we're like damn he can do that cuz he's mostly robot and tired eyes what how are they going to fight him um so i really i i just i think it's very good i my one of my favorite lines here as they're trying to sort of they're trapped on this ship it's falling apart grievous is like sayonara suckers they've got to they've got to land this thing on coruscant and i love this line from obi-wan that's like can you fly this thing and anakin goes under the circumstances i'd say the ability to fly this thing is irrelevant <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Which is such like a good. like almost like a very nerdy way to respond, which I feel like is, is something that like is a very small aspect of Anakin that we hardly ever get to see. Where it, it was almost like the um, like I, I I almost expected Obi Wan to be like English, please, like in that in that sort of way mm -hmm. of just like how Anakin responds that way. It's fucking great. Yeah, and I love you. You do see like you know throughout this. Obi-Wan is not comfortable with technology. Obi-Wan does, he can fly and he's really good, but he's good because he's a Jedi. He's not good because he likes flying. And so seeing Anakin, like kind of being in charge of this, like grab that, pull up on that. Let's go. We're coming in too hot. I love this. I love the introduction of like these flying fireman ships. That's really fun to me. Yeah. Like just these flying fire extinguishers as they're landing. And I think this landing shot, this crash landing shot is so good like it's so the, detailed like the the building that it runs into and like how that collapses and also like the you know the, they've got these firemen hosing down this enemy ship which like did they mm -hmm. was there communication at all of like hey uh we're part of we're in grievous's ship 
and it, but it's just us, so you don't have to worry about like enemies crash yeah. landing on this planet. Uh, you, you know, we're. I cool. think if there's a we're giant cool. fireball coming at your city, you kind of just like hose down the fireball, regardless. Yeah, you know, that's fair. That's fair. Um, but I love it. It ends with that perfect, like they just skid up into frame, and then of course you get another happy landing <laughs> with the with the hair stroke too from Ewan yeah, McGregor. Just, oh uh, my god, Ewan McGregor starts off trying to play a young Alec Guinness and at the end just playing like a swashbuckling Errol Flynn, just like smooth talking pirate. Like I just, I love where he goes with Obi-Wan in this, you know? Agreed. Um, we're back in Coruscant. Uh, I love this exchange between the two of them where they're both like, oh no, you should definitely, you're the hero. You hang out in Senate all day. It's like, oh no, 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 no. You hang out in Senate all day. No, really. Um, and I do, this is the I, scene. yeah, it's very cute. It's because they're joking about how neither one of them wants to be a part of it. But mm -hmm. Obi-Wan is genuinely saying, no, you're the hero. You did a lot today. You did this, you, you know, you saved me from, from being shot down. You rescued the chancellor. You landed the ship. You Carrying did me this. unconscious on your back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I think this is one of those other moments where like the pride that Obi-Wan feels for Anakin as a genuine sense of friendship that is not talking down to him, that isn't coming from this kind of like uh, good work champ perspective, just as like, nah, man, you freaking did it. Like, please yeah. take a moment to enjoy it. And him seeing the like darkness that Anakin carries around and his lack of ability to just enjoy a success at all. Um, I think that was the part that I was like, I think that's important again. I think it's a moment that speaks to their friendship. And it also speaks to Obi-Wan being like, man, you got to lighten up a little bit. Like, can't you just take a minute? Yeah. Where's some white? Your closet's looking pretty, pretty dark right now. You yeah. know what I mean? It's not white a color, face, just some pop dad. <laughs> yeah. I remember my mother saying Congrats all of these things to me as a teenager. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, they report on what went down. Uh, Mace Windu says, don't worry, General uh, General Grievous will run and hide. He always does. And, I'll, and then, of course, we see as they're all walking off to Senate, up comes Padme. And I'll tell you what, I do, do, I do like, look, clearly they're not hiding, which is a thing, <laughs> but they're, they're in pretty plain view. I guess they're in the shadow of a column, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's uh. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Oh. Mm -mm. Um, it's Buffy uh, the Vampire Slayer hiding. Yeah, it's the way yeah, that you yeah. can be right in front of a window, but as yeah. long as you're not directly outside, you're fine. As long as there's a little awning, you can be in the sun. Yeah, if he's got a if he's got a parasol, <laughs> he could be a good he could be a good vampire. Yeah. So, but like also like uh, you know even though they're they're you're, they're hugging they're embracing they're kind of hiding again like uh, you know it's it's not a secret that they are friends with each other as well. Yeah, and uh, again like a, appreciation for season seven of Clone Wars right like they kind of reinforce. Um, at the very beginning of that season, like how long he's been gone from course. Like they have not seen yeah. each other in a very long mm -hmm. time. How long yeah. has it been? Does anyone know? It's like approximately? Like, before it's been, she it's had been a baby like, bump. Yeah, it's been a few months. Like they haven't seen each other in a while. Mm -hmm. And I think I do love everything up until, well, here's what I'm going to say. In this exchange, I do genuinely feel the the attraction and the chemistry between the two of them which you don't always you know one of the one of the criticisms leveled against this these prequels is you don't always feel that uh i think i think it is very strained and it's not very realistic in attack of the clones at all and george lucas has said he had trouble with this relationship he had trouble writing it he had trouble making it feel natural but i think in these scenes and in these moments where they're sort of where the actors are sort of given emotional beats to kind of grab onto mm -hmm. you know that are clear emotional beats they respond in kind and i do love the interaction between hayden and and natalie here now when she says something wonderful has happened annie i'm pregnant the tone kind of changes a bit it, neither it one does. of them i don't think yeah. under knew what they were trying to get to in that moment and and that's it's weird because I think that uh, I'll, I'm I'm pretty much right there with you, and I think a lot of it has to do with the score. As most of this movie, even when things aren't 
particularly my favorite when it has such a great score underneath it it carries it a bit more and the across the stars love theme is like so damn good that i feel like anybody any two people on screen and you play that music i'm like i believe yeah. they're in love and like I, I will say that Hayden Christensen and Allie Portman like push that to its limits. Like they really, really, really try for me to not believe in them. Um, but I feel like there are these moments every once in a while where like, I, I can see this. I believe this. I understand it. But then, yeah, the conversation about like, hey, I'm pregnant and the way he reacts, the way she reacts. I'm like, what the hell are they doing here? That's the thing. I don't know how either of them feel about it. I have a much clearer idea of how she feels about it because he and I get what he was going for. What he was going for is. I'm scared, this is big, there are all of these implications that come along with this. I'm going to try and put on a brave face and pretend like I'm very excited for this. I get that that was the intention, but instead he goes, ha, huh, ha, huh. huh? hmm? And he gives every emotion that his face can possibly offer in that moment, and I can't tell which one is real. They're all fake. <laughs> it's so weird. It's such a weird interaction. And then he goes to like, this is a happy moment. Let's celebrate after just having been like, shit. <laughs> like, fuck. And I like, he genuinely can't tell. It doesn't feel like he's trying to cover that. There's, it's not in the performance. It goes away when he goes yeah. to the like, I'm happy about this now. I try to remember that, that Anakin at this point is 19 and Padme is 25. And I'm trying to think of like telling a 19 year old kid that he's a dad and how yeah. weird and how, what a weird alien he's going to be about that. You know what I mean? And I don't think that he should be just excited because, again, there are huge implications to that as well mm -hmm. for him, you know, as a Jedi and all of this. I just think he's got to pick. <laughs> I think yeah. he's just got to feel something, honestly. Yeah, uh, I get that. I totally get that. And this, of course, is a moment where it's like, this is where you say, cool, I'm not really, I'm not really meshing with the Jedi anyway. It's great. We'll announce our relationship. We'll be together. I still know how to do God cool no, force no. shit. There's probably something for me to do out there. Yeah. I'll be I'll be good. I've learned to trade. The trade is making things float with my mind. And I will go out <laughs> and I will get a job. You know what I mean? You know, I, I think I think this is where you first uh oh <laughs> a little bit, a little bit internet troubles today. Sounds like <laughs> uh, this it is the scene that you though. referenced earlier, Tim. Though, uh, where Natalie Portman does brush out her fresh curls, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very bold move. Uh, it's yeah, just, this is the balcony <laughs> scene, right? Uh, and, yeah. yeah. And the fun for our our four hour cut. Half of this conversation was cut out uh, when when they start getting into the yeah. you know um, you know uh, so love has blinded you and he's like I'm so in love so, with you it's like they just they cut, cut one of Natalie Portman's six lines for the extended time <laughs> <know. line>? but <laughs> they <laughs> added they all of yeah. the deleted two scenes hours of content okay yeah, you're gonna cut one of I work pretty cool hold up we're about to get to the brushing her hair a hundred times on each side which Padme <laughs> Padme does brush her hair quite a bit in this trilogy. Uh, but to be fair, she's got a good head of hair. Now that's what girls do. That's what they girls do. Hair. And they love horses. And what else do Lip we know? Lip gloss. Lip gloss. <laughs> but before we get there, we see uh, Grievous's cool ship that lands like bugs. I like all the ships that land like bugs. Mm -hmm. um, his ship lands, and he runs to go talk to Darth Sidious. Who could Darth Sidious be? Could it's be anyone. Unclear. You only see three quarters of his face. You know, it, I, that, that's the weirdest thing. Is like I was so unclear, and I'm happy. I'm happy that they found a way to shock his fucking face to make him look <laughs> a little more disfigured, just so mm -hmm. just to make it clear. So I understood. Oh, he's that guy. Well, he does have to eventually, at some point, look like that. Um, but it's like I, I feel like that could be explained by the dark side of the force yeah. kind of just corrupts you over time or something. Sure. Instead of what they decided to do. Which is one of my least favorite choices of this film. Oh, we'll get there, and I love it for a million reasons. Um, but this is where they talk about, uh, this is where you see, like, a real good chicken run from Grievous for the first time. He gets, like, yeah. that long shot where he comes mm -hmm. off, and he's doing his, like, he looks like, he looks like a Bloodborne character running. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? He looks like mm -hmm. a, he looks like he's from a Souls game when he runs, and I love it. Um so he's moving. He's move the move the separatists to Mustafar. Uh, the end of you know the end of the war is near. Soon I will have a new apprentice. You know because uh, Grievous is like, what about Count Duke? He's like, Psh, I got an even cooler, better. He's younger and cooler looking, and he's so <laughs> rad. And he's gonna 
bring <laughs> balance and you're he's even better than dooku dooku sucked <laughs> um <laughs> dooku just head still rolling and he's like yeah. oh that guy never even mattered <laughs> uh then we go back to coruscant with uh this is this is where i do have problems with the minimization of padme and the the sort of infantilization of padme in this film where we show in the second film we show in the first and second film first film child queen very familiar with being yep. a badass is being what you're a saying. Being a fucking badass. You set up Padme dude. to be so cool. Huh? Sorry. Hey, <laughs> right she gets half her you, shirt whipped into a crop top and it's fine. Yeah, she, she does. She does. That happens as well. <laughs> you know, but she becomes, she, she's very politically involved. She understands what's going on in the galaxy. She is, and, and that sort of gets taken away from her more and more as she becomes like just the object of Vader's obsession. Um, and, and I will say that I don't like that. I do like, I kind of like this conversation here that they have, uh, and that you're so beautiful. It's only because I'm so in love. No, it's because I'm so in love with you. Uh, this is the Shakespearean exchange that I'm talking about. Like this feels very like 12th night or midsummer night. Yeah. They even me. put it on a balcony, man. <laughs> yeah. It's so good. And like, and because the two of them are actors, they're like, oh, I think I know what this scene is. And yeah. even though like the style of this dialogue is different than you're used to in Star Wars. I think it's fun because it's so Shakespearean. Uh, and that's that's why I like it. But I don't dislike this exchange at all. I actually think that this moment between them is very sweet. And I think the way that it feels different from Star Wars could be seen as intentional in that this is their little sneak away moment and their break from the Star War. Um, this isn't supposed to be happening. This isn't how they're supposed to behave. None of this is placed within the universe we understand because it is a breaking of the rules. Um, and I think that that's very cool. But this does start an incredible arc where for the next approximately almost two full hours, Natalie Portman will only exclusively talk to Anakin. And ask questions about how Anakin is feeling and what Anakin is going to do. And this is so far from passing... The worst... Go for it. This is so far from passing the Bechdel test. It like it doesn't check a single box. To pass the Bechdel test, you only have to pass one of those marks, and it doesn't pass a single one of them. Yeah, uh, it's this is a bummer, and we'll talk more about some of the stuff that was taken away from Padme and Barrett. You can certainly speak to that uh, as you've been rewatching stuff. But there's a lot of Padme that was uh, that was changed as they were recutting this film and reshooting this film, and I and I think that the character did suffer heavily for it. Uh, this is where we get our first. Dream sequence in all of Star Wars, <laughs> and it's really problematic. I think to the yeah. the core concept of like I know a lot of people joke about midichlorians and it's like oh episode one kind of ruined the idea of the force and all that stuff. And like to the extent I, I I'm with them on that, but I think that this is really where it started jumping the shark in a way where it's like. So I understand that the prequels, for all their issues, have this overarching story with uh, Emperor Palpatine kind of controlling everything behind the scenes, and it's his rise to power, and it's an actually really cool story if you were to just tell people, like, the highlights and cut all the bullshit, but just talk about Palpatine's kind of rise and what he did and the trade federations and all that. It's like, this is way more involved than I would have ever thought Star Wars would be. Mm -hmm. But then for it to culminate in so many seemingly random things having to happen and resulting in Pat may being pregnant going to have the kid anakin getting these visions and then palpatine knowing about this and playing on that information with him with the whole opera scene we get to later it's like i hate that all of it could be written away and logically like oh yeah well he just kind of like made that all happen uh in his head to Anakin. it's like well we don't see that so this comes yeah. off as like very you're writing to, to to write yourself out of another hole to write yourself into the next plot point and like I just really don't like that yeah we get into we definitely get into a moment into some stuff here where um where the characters stop interacting with each other like like normal people will will these conversations begin to turn into conversations that that sort of advance the plot more and and you're you're right even though palpatine is very is just so 10 out of 10 perfect in this film. We have not seen this sort of thing from him. We do not get any idea of the scope of his power until sort of act three of this film. And 
we're missing that. We're missing these machinations. We're missing we're missing the witches over the cauldron. You know what I mean? If this is going to be Shakespearean, show me a little bit of what of what these guys are doing other than yeah. move this guy over here. Show me mm -hmm. a little bit more of this power in action and show me some more of your influence over people. And I, I totally get what you're saying. And it's interesting, too, because, you know, they play it up throughout this entire prequel trilogy. Like, all right, you, you know, Palpatine is the bad guy. Like, you, you know, this guy from episode six and we're going to, like, have fun with that. But then, like, when it comes to actual, like, you know, plot points and, like, character arcs and stuff like that and, like, uh, things that would help actually progress in the plot and not be reductive for mm -hmm. things like they don't play with that at all. Like let's get an, a, you know, a 10 out of 10 Ian McDermott uh, scene where he's like putting the dream into Anakin and shit like that. And like, yeah, you could have had fun with that. But like when, you know, those moments it's matter to play with that, they didn't take those chances, which I just find again, I, I Lucas needed, you know, not a bunch of yes men helping well, make this. Especially movie. like in a movie that talks so much about like figuring out what the nature of the mysterious dark side of the force is. Uh, we know that the light side is about into we know that the light is about intuition. It's about uh sort of like the manipulation of objects. You can manipulate people, but you try not to. Like we we've seen what the light side sort of shows itself as. You know, in the original trilogy, we see the dark side as like a little bit of lightning and uh, you throw air conditioners at your son, you know? So like, we don't know the extent of it yet. Showing some of these more manipulative powers, I think would have been a very cool way to go. And they do, they do go more into the nature of the force and the dark side and how the dark side can use its powers in the Clone Wars in things like the Mortis series and, and stuff like that. So um, it does get explained later. And a lot of these things, you know, with hindsight and with, with the additional canon, do become better, you know, but we're talking about the movie on its own here. This is, of course, the dream of uh, Padme screaming for help and dying. Uh, Anakin gets up in bed. It shows off a sweet fucking hero shot of that robot arm, man. Yeah. I know this scene's not it about that. I know that scene's not about that, but when he gets up and he's like, oh, I had a bad dream and it's with a robot arm, I'm like, Fuck, and this is robot arm. Ridiculously yeah. big pecs that, like, they, I don't think we ever see ever again. But besides the hopefully shot, again, we will. Yeah, and hopefully, it's just hopefully. like Jesus Christ, this is a this is a shot uh, right here. Yeah, and in and in you know in in direct opposition to those giant pecs, can you believe how much how much muscle mass Thor lost to be in this movie? When she comes out to the when she comes out to the to the porch, their cool porch with all their Philips Hue lights, um, <laughs> she comes out and Thor has lost like forty to fifty pounds of muscle. Um, this is sort of the last, the last scene where we see what I think up until the end is a little bit of Padme acting like an autonomous adult in a relationship saying things like, how long is it going to take for us to be honest with each other? Right. This is where she's saying like, no, if the more you hide from me, the harder this gets, you know, and there is something to this where it's like, I understand how scarring your childhood was. I understand your, I, I understand your instinct to retreat, but we're married now. I'm going to have your kid. How long is this all going to be secrecy and lies? Um, you know, and that's where they get into, and she finally asks, like, hey, if you're so worried about this, if you really believe this is going to happen, do you think Obi-Wan would be able to help us? And he says, we don't need his help. Which is wild, because at this point, he hasn't really been offered anything yet so mm -hmm. why are you already saying we don't need obi-wan's help obi-wan's been nothing but dope as hell to you so like if that line came after some of the kind of like insidious manipulation like a little further along yeah. in the relationship with palpatine i would understand but at this point you're just kind of being rude to obi-wan for no reason yeah i the, think this is sorry i'm sorry go ahead barrett uh it, it, like we're saying like in the context of just this movie it makes absolutely no sense you know when they're quippy buds they're the best of fucking buds but again yeah. the like bringing in the full context right like the last time you know anakin saw um someone go to the jedi order when you know they were down in the dumps and you know the, the things were not going their way 
was when Ahsoka got kicked out of the order and then, you know, had to do everything she could and with him to prove her innocence. And then they were like, oh, well, you know, this was your, you know, this was your Jedi Knight training. Oops, that's on us. Uh, And that's why she eventually leaves. And so, you know, again, like they do everything they can in that show to like help. Uh, like boost this uh, these these moments up of like in you know realistic yeah, in the but canon. I think like even, he's like I don't know if I can trust them with this. Yeah, and I think they even within just the context of this movie, we already know we already know his how much how much pride he has. We already know how much he wants to be a Jedi Master. We mm-hmm. already know how much he wants Obi Wan to see him as an equal. And he just you know just I'm trying to put myself back into this like you're 19. And you're just like 22. confused. You're beautiful. Anyway. He's 22 okay. now in this yeah. one. Okay, he's 22 in this one. Then never mind. Everything is done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, gross this is bullshit. No, oh, uh, no. I still try to think about this. Like, he just doesn't want to. He doesn't want to tell Obi Wan anything that will make Obi Wan disappointed in him. You know, and I and don't I do think, get that. I just. I think. I don't know. I don't know. It gets a little lost, but I think that's the motivation here. Uh, he yeah. does go. He does go to see Yoda, though, mm-hmm. um, and he does talk to Yoda about premonitions. Here we get some of some of Yoda's best, best, best Yoda lines. I love this, and I also love the lighting of this scene. They do yeah. a lot of great stuff where they constantly keep Anakin in this film half in the dark. Mm-hmm. And it's, real foreshadowing. It's beautiful. This is this has got that, those Roger Deakins blinds, even though it's in the future. Yeah. They got space blinds, and I <laughs> yeah. I love that they're sitting in front of the space blinds, and and you know, Anakin says, "But what if what if this is true? How do I stop it?" And Yoda just says, "Hey, people die. The fear of loss is the path to the dark side. You know, mourn them, do not miss them, do not train yourself to let go of everything you fear to lose." And Yoda's trying to tell him here, you're going to make this happen. Right. This is this will be you making this happen. Um, and of course, Anakin doesn't understand that. Anakin doesn't listen. He's a little too in his feels. Right. But also, this is this is one of those moments where it's like, I am I'm sort of glad that they push Yoda to the other end of the of the galaxy in the middle of this film, because after a conversation like that. You would think that Yoda would would inform everybody to like, hey, we need to like not just box this kid out, but we need to keep an eye on him and make sure that we are protecting him because he's sort of beginning to slip, you know, which is something that Yoda would would I think do from what we yeah. know of Yoda. Uh, but, but again, it like harkens uh, back to the whole like the Jedi order kind of losing their way of like, even the, you know, I think Yoda is almost a little bit misguided in the scene of like the mourn them, do not miss them, do not like, you know, that's, I, I feel like that's so antithetical to what, you know, Luke learns in you know the, the uh, original trilogy. And that's what Yoda tries to teach Luke. He's like, you know, don't, don't get hung up on your friends and stuff like that. But then, you know, you see Luke's arc uh, be about, you know, it, it becomes a very anime thing where my power comes from my love for my friends and it's the mm-hmm. best shit ever. And I, I, and I love that, you know, uh, Lucas was trying to acknowledge that of like, Hey, like this little green man that everybody adores, you know, he gets some shit right, but you know, there are some very key things he gets wrong that like leads to them fucking up this dude's life and their lives. Yeah. And they're distracted. There's a war on things are happening. Everybody's busy. Uh, so when he doesn't get the, uh, advice that he wants from the little green man, he goes to his other. While Anthony's gone, I'm just going to talk. Uh, that totally has like a confessional vibe, right? Like I think that that's what they did with the, like the slats in it. I think that they Mm -hmm. really created a space confessional. Uh, and in that moment it is preacher Yoda. Yeah. Yes, hundred percent. I'm gonna hear and your I, confession. Do your penance. I have nothing more to say. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> Get your head right with God. Uh, <laughs> and when Anakin doesn't like that, he goes to see his other buddy, uh, Palpatine, who says, "Walk with me in a circle around my circle room." And oh, yeah. please, please, let's look, dude. The amount of shots in this movie that are two people. And I know everyone's talked about this already. That it's just two people walking, and and that's the, all the movie is. It's more than that. It's two people walking, stopping together, 
turning and then walking another direction and then turning and just walking another direction within a space then it, if you follow their paths it makes no sense why anyone would walk that way let alone multiple people all having this understanding of stop and not turn and go it's so bizarre you know uh, sometimes you know, you're just space? walking <laughs> maybe it's space man yeah. you're right you're right these are space <laughs> rules we're dealing with very different uh, right but of course palpatine gives him gives him a little bit of the uh, of the things that he wants to hear which is like hey man they you know i trust you i understand you you know the jedi they they're not listening to you but listen i want to give you a little a little promotion for being a good boy i want you to be the eyes the ears and the voice of the republic on the council for me you're going to be my personal rep on the council. And even Anakin at this point goes, uh, do you have any jurisdiction over the Jedi Council? Like, are you allowed to do that? I would imagine because they're so involved in the, um, you know, in the army and like essentially being uh, generals and stuff like that. Like, I, I imagine he does in wartime, especially like have yeah. some sort of say. Right. But, you know, that the council is not going to like that because the council is like my guy. Keep out of our council. This and is Obi-Wan, council business. And the scene immediately before this, that very, very short scene in between the two that we talked mm-hmm. about, he literally just passes by Obi-Wan. And Obi-Wan's like, hey, be careful with Palpatine. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's totally. it. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of like, hey, man, I don't like that dude. And, you know, Anakin just being like, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, he has no reason not with obi i understand doing it with the council but specifically with obi-wan who's like just doing his best yeah and i i don't want to dwell on this too much because i know it's just like it sounds like i'm just being negative and like pit, nitpicking everything but i think the problem is like the whole story like we had to do the palpatine thing right he is behind mm-hmm. everything and like every single event he kind of has to have his hands in to get us where we know we need to be which is anakin turning into darth vader the prequels right solely exist for that storyline of Anakin yeah. becoming Darth Vader. That's why I think it's so bizarre they make some of the choices they do of making the Jedi not the good guys. They're kind of bad and this whole idea of the att- attachments are bad and all that stuff. All of that is just to serve the plot of Palpatine needing to meet up with Anakin and, and connecting on the dark side stuff. And it just gets yeah. convoluted in a way where it's like, okay, I understand that the, you're making the story the Jedi aren't what we think they are, but why'd you make that decision if it was going to be this convoluted and yeah. weird where we're watching this and we're like, even given the rules you've given us, Anakin and Obi-Wan should be getting along a little bit better. Like, And it, it could all be written away with Palpatine was corrupting Anakin, but it's like, yeah. that sucks. And again, that's why like, I, I, I constantly say of like, if he had just, uh, Lucas had just been like, you know what, I'm not going to make another trilogy movie I think that like the, the uh, amount of complexities here need to be written into like a, a almost a show format to give us the time to build all of these ideas. They, he had way too many things that he was trying to boil, boil they down tried to, into they, three. They two had a lot movies. of ideas. They had a lot of ideas for three movies, um, and and they, you know, some of the stuff that they, you know, they they didn't do a great job. I think in, in a lot of in a lot of moments of paring that down. Um, when we get to the council. Yoda, of course, does not like this. Mace Windu says, you're on the council, but we do not grant you the rank of master. Anakin immediately throws a hissy fit, showing why he's not yet a Jedi master, (laughs) catches himself doing it and goes, I'm sorry, master. Okay, I'm going to sit down. And it's like, (laughs) and it's like, ooh, even like Obi-Wan looks at him in this moment and is just like, dude, embarrassing. There's only so many seats in this little room. Did that like feel? Did that feel right as you were doing it, my guy? Like you've got that lo- you've got that look yeah. on Obi Wan's face where he's like trying to keep it together. Uh, some of my, my my two other notes about this scene are just Kai Adimundi owns. Oh yes, for sure, a hundred percent. I love his giant weird head and his cool smart beard, and I love him, and he's perfect. And also. What about the droid attack on the Wookiees, which is one of my favorite lines <laughs> in all of Star Wars, because it comes out of nowhere. What about the droid attack on the Wookiees? And I, I'm sitting in the audience the first time going, oh, shit, there's a droid attack on the Wookiees? <laughs> oh, nice order of business. <laughs> we got, we definitely, Kayati Mundi's right. We got to do something. <laughs> 
Yeah, um, I mean, it's it's funny though because like that it, it does stick out like such a sore thumb, and it's because they only put that in there to have the weird fan service. No, what happened of- is that they were talking about they were trying to start the topic of the droid attack on the Wookiees, and then Anakin came barging in, being like, "Hey, Palpatine wants me to be a Jedi Master on this council," yeah. and they're like, "Fuck, now we got to deal with this." All yeah. right, you're on this council, but you're not a master. He has this hissy fit. All right, guys, what about this fucking droid attack on these goddamn Wookiees, okay? Yeah. Can we yeah. please get back to the droid attack on the Wookiees? <laughs> they really but looked like, at his fit and they went, okay, so anyways. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, we got to talk about, like, how we can possibly make Yoda and Chewbacca meet, because that's that's what we're going to do now. Uh, <laughs> right. But it's funny, and I know that it's very different, and we're, we're decades away from this movie coming out. And just Movies are made differently now. But in Endgame, when it happens and it starts off, and you're like, oh, man, five years have passed, and we have this group of people talking, and they've been trying to do their best with the state of the world, and then they reference, like, oh, there's been some, like, earthquakes in – uh, around Wakanda mm-hmm. or whatever. It's like just kind of teasing things and you hear it and you're like, oh, that's kind of cool. Had they just been like, yeah, those like droids are attacking the Wookiee home planet Kashyyyk. It's like, oh, cool, Wookiee. I know what that is. Like, I, I, I see what they're doing here. They're they're connecting it to world yeah. elements that I know. But instead, they're like, no, no, no. We're going to spend multiple minutes, like mul- tens of minutes of our runtime of this movie on getting Yoda and freaking Chewbacca to hang out. Well, it's it's also about getting Yoda far enough away, right? It, you, the, it's about the splitting up, and this is part of Palpatine's plan. It's part of it. It's split the Jedi Council up as best you can, so they cannot work together, and they do not have each other to rely on. Um, so, from that from that perspective, I do see it. Uh, something that was cut originally, Yoda uh, does not go to Kashyyyk. Uh, and uh, uh, Obi Wan does not go to Utapau before Yoda, Obi Wan, and Mace Windu all talk about Palpatine and the Jedi Temple. And they actually say it's possible that Palpatine is this Sith Lord that we're looking for. And Yoda says, "Look, that may be true, but he's now the most powerful person in the galaxy, and we better have proof if we're gonna if we are uh, going to God. say that." Why everybody. would they cut that? That is that could have that would have filled so many holes for me in this movie. Mm-hmm. When you have people like Yoda and you have people like Obi Wan, all of these extremely powerful Jedi masters, and people can stand in the room with a Sith Lord and just be like, "I don't know what's up with that guy." No, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, of and course. especially even adding all of the Clone Wars and adding all of the the extra content here, it's like we see that when something happens, these characters feel it through the Force. Like Bear was talking earlier, we see Darth Maul feel it. We see all the like constantly in the Star Wars franchise in every iteration we've seen. When something bad's going on, every character that is of a certain power level is like, "Oh shit, something bad's going on." Right. And like, it's just so <laughs> weird that they they treat it like this big mystery up until the very last minute. Like it almost <laughs> feels like I know it's a little before this, but it almost feels like Mace Windu has to be reflecting the lightning back to Palpatine before everyone's like, oh, "Okay." He's <laughs> standing like, there over him like Wait it's a definitely minute. him. Yeah. <laughs> now ripping the mask off Scooby Doo style. <laughs> Now we do get in this scene a little bit of something that serves the same purpose as that conversation. You know, Obi-Wan catches up to Anakin and is like, hey man, I know they didn't make you a master, but nobody as young as you has ever been on the temple before. Obi-Wan is like, if you've ever been young at a big company or something, and you've got that, you've got that person who sees your talent and they're like, no, it's all coming and I know this is run poorly, but if you be patient, I promise it will happen. You're young and you don't understand how the industry works, but this is very good for you. And of course you're young and you go, fuck you, this is garbage. I deserve the promotion. This is that conversation right now. Totally. He's saying, look, you just said that so well, though, Carvoni. I appreciate <laughs> that because it's like again talking about these movies. I think that it, we we can make them better in some ways, and I think that, that there's there are bones here. There are things mm-hmm. to kind of build upon. I just find it frustrating that Anakin's story of the first movie was "Sorry, bro, you're too young," and now the story <laughs> of this one is "Sorry, bro." Like you know, it's like what? How is this still the same type of like? Because look at how large your head is and how many beard you have to have before you can be on the Jedi Council. His head is neither large enough, nor is his beard full enough. Hang I'm sorry, I said it backwards. Anthony. I meant episode one was he's too old, and then episode three is uh. too young, is what I was trying to say. Well, right. he's too old to be trained, too young for the council. Always a bridesmaid. Yeah. 
Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and they made the rules. <laughs> I've got what I think is maybe a Jedi Council hot take. Maybe it's not. I don't like Mace Windu. I think Samuel L. Mm. Jackson is terrible in this movie. Oh, yeah. I think he is distractingly bad. And every time he speaks, I'm just like, Jesus Christ, man. Are you reading it off of cue cards? Yeah. And, and Have you what... never seen the script? You didn't see the last two movies. You didn't watch them back. You had no interest in remembering what your character was yeah. about. You had no interest in knowing your lines. It's and that's what that's usually my example of when I talk about of like people want to like throw Hayden Christensen under the bus, uh, Natalie Portman, who we know is a great, a fantastic fucking actress, and you know I don't think it's any of the fault of the actors. The guy who directed all three of these movies is a robot and who does not know how to direct people. No. He took okay. himself off of Empire. <laughs> oh, no, he all right. is. He took himself <laughs> off of directing Empire and Jedi because of his experience with Star Wars and him not understanding how to deal with these three kids he cast in his like experimental sci-fi uh, like startup movie and he was like I can't like I can't keep being like on the human side of the directing stuff and the f like and that's why I make the argument of like it's not you know Christensen's fault it's not um you know all of these actors fault because yeah. George Lucas doesn't know how to direct people. When you make uh, Samuel Jackson, the guy who fucking I'm yells, I'm tired of these motherfucking snakes on this motherfucking plane, the most boring person in your so fucking stiff. trilogy, that's not on the actors. That's on George Lucas. Here's what I will say. I think Hayden Christensen and Natalie Portman and every other actor in this movie performs better than Samuel L. Jackson does. I think every performer in this movie uh, does better than Samuel L. Jackson throughout every is, line that he reads sounds like he is speaking for the first time ever <laughs> it is, is mace windu wild slander, to me and yes I'm moving it on is mace windu master. slander because i think mace windu sucks i'm, I'm sorry. moving on now mace, now mace windu sucking is a different thing and we can talk about that but i will mace not take windu this sucks, like, and samuel L. jackson sucks as mace windu uh the scene ends she's not wrong <laughs> the scene ends with anakin being asked by obi-wan to be a little secret spy boy and now Anakin's been asked to be a little secret spy boy by both sides, and he is torn. Uh, now, Mace Windu, who apparently sucks, says, <laughs> uh, <laughs> says it's very dangerous putting them together. I don't think the boy can handle it. I don't think the boy can handle being in such, in such close proximity to the Faustian man. Uh, and then they go, well, wait, is he not the chosen one? And Yoda goes, well, you know, you can misread prophecies, my guys. And there are, there's more than one way to bring balance to the force. Which is so ah! important. I love this. <laughs> and, and I love that, like, they've known about this kid for a long time. Qui-Gon Jinn picked up this kid, has this inkling that he might be this kid, referencing this prophecy. And what is it? How old is he in, in uh, Phantom Menace? He's like nine Right? Yeah. Oh, 13 yeah, I think, years yeah. later, no. they finally are like, maybe we read that prophecy wrong. You know, That's like, so what? funny. <laughs> now, what Yoda, no, because I think what Yoda is saying here is, oh, he's going to bring balance, but we don't, we don't know what that means. I still think are, that's misreading the prophecy. It's yeah, not misreading as in it's a different kid. It is yeah. him, but they made a lot of assumptions filling in some gaps in that prophecy. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, we know he's the kid. We know that something is going to balance out the force. We did not stop to ask what that meant. <laughs> We've always read it this one particular way. Because remember, this whole this whole trilogy is about the Jedi being stuck in their ways and uh, being able to, being able to not sense that the Jedi Temple on Coruscant is actually built on top of a massive Sith temple, which also is not brought up in these films, but like <laughs> it's pretty important. Like it, it's in you know looking back, the fact that the shrine in the depths is down there under Coruscant, and it's kind of the reason Coruscant and the Jedi Temple thrived so much is because of the energy of this. Anyway, moving on. Um, what I'm saying is there are reasons for it all, and once again, we love the expanded canon. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, so then we get a conversation between are two star-crossed lovers, these young, secretly married, Romeo and Juliet. I think the war is destroying the principles of this Republic. Yeah. And what if the Republic is evil, asked Natalie Portman, 
turning and looking directly at us in the year 2022 through the camera, yeah. just like, do you understand? Do you understand what we were saying back? Okay, no? seventeen years right. ago. Yeah. Okay. Right. We right. want to talk about how this guy, you know, was able to to profit off of you know the uh, complications of modern politics and then rose to power. Hmm. hmm. It's almost hmm. like Padme's always had a. Point. Again, Lucas had the <laughs> he had the ingredients there, y'all. He was so close. Uh, and of course, this ends once again with the with with Padme. Don't shut me out. Let me yeah. help you. In her worst hat. In her, where, oh. Bill, she didn't have time to fully yeah. brush her hair. <laughs> I just think like like Padme looks are everything. The yeah. women of the galaxy serve on a level that no other franchise does, in my opinion. And mm -hmm. um, they dropped they dropped this one a little bit. For Is this me. the one oh. where her, her she kind of has the Leia buns a little bit? She but has high the. Up. She has the Leia buns when they reconnect uh, immediately when he comes back from the war and they haven't seen each other in months. That's gotcha. her Leia buns. Oh, okay. uh, okay. This one, she's smaller buns and she has like a brown tiara essentially that covers the majority of the top of her head in a very strange way. It almost blends into her hair, but it's metal. Hmm. It's a valid choice. It's fine. It's, it's one of the more interesting choices, yeah. Um, Anakin chewing on this uh, this stuff that his his wife has supposed, but not really, heads to the theater uh, to meet a politician because nothing bad can happen to a politician at the opera. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where everybody is apparently everybody is this, apparently pondering their orb. Mm -hmm. Dude, this is the moment of the movie that if you've made it this far in, you're just <laughs> like, I am in. Yeah. I'm in, guys. Like they've got they're committing to what this is and it is what it is yeah you're and either you either have decided and you hate what it is at this point or is you love this shit. yeah it, it, it is it completely is. ian mcdermid where they used this line one of these lines in the trailer again granted you know we didn't know at the time of the quality of this movie but the trailer for you know uh rise of skywalker like ha like pulled some of that stuff um the like whole unnatural line like oh so good. There's Again, so when you talk about stuff. the teasing of like how little we know about like what the dark side has access to of what that shit can do, just like the little tidbits here is oh, it's so good. Yeah. So he, uh, good boy Palpatine is watching the drone orb <laughs> because it's just it's just like this weird droning. But like if you look at the orbs of water that are floating. There's some sort of like rhythmic swimming gymnastics thing that's sort of happening, but there it's just the music is just this drone and people are just staring unmoving at this orb. This is a very unsettling scene and I enjoy it a lot. Um, Palpatine goes very it goes, "Hey, I have good news. Come closer. Everybody leave us. Grievous is hiding in the Utapal system. This is great. This is wonderful news." And then he says, you know, they start talking. He goes, come sit next to me. He goes, oh, they asked you to spy on me, didn't they? Oh, I didn't want to, I didn't want to do this to you, but I am afraid I'm just going to have to tell you the truth of the Jedi. And the thing is, they want control of the Republic. They clearly, they clearly want to take over the Senate and remove me from power. And they want to run everything and they want to have a totalitarian regime, and boy, oh boy, it's bad. Boy, oh boy, it's bad. And you don't like spying, do you, bud? You don't like spying. And Anakin goes, you know, I got to admit, I got to admit, it made me feel bad when they asked me to spy. And he goes, I know, I know. Ew, so gross. It's a shame they don't like you the way I like you, you my special little guy. By the way... <laughs> Just, you know, just to let you know, if you did perhaps theoretically know someone who was going to die, maybe the dark side was the, would be the only thing that could save them. Maybe. Do you like the drone orb? Because I know the drone orb. I can get you a signed 8x10 of the drone orb when all this is over. <laughs> who's your buddy? Who's your pal? <laughs> So, like, real talk, what is the explanation of him knowing about Anakin's situation right now? Um, now, he he does not. He is simply 
bringing up a conversation yeah. about good and evil, right? Because Anakin says, but the Jedi are good people. And he says, hey, good's a point of view. You know, here's the thing about the dark side of the force. You know, the Jedi are so locked into their own thing. They don't know what kind of stuff the dark side can do. Yeah. I Did you else. ever hear the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? And he uses, I thought not. You, you know, he uses that story um, to t kind of compare them of like their power, like they're like scared for losing power. Essentially, mm -hmm. yeah, that's how he's. I, that's how he subtly transitions over to like you know. You can. I save see Tim's from face. Death. <laughs> Tim's face is like, what do you mean he doesn't know? Because I absolutely think he knows. I agree. No, he does uh, know, he but he's acting like he doesn't. He's acting like he doesn't, but like but very poorly. Well, because uh, he's the so one that's putting the dreams of um, Padme dying into Anakin's mm -hmm. uh, head. But once again, okay, what Tim is saying, no, what no, no, Tim no, no, no. is saying, how does Barrett, he know that she's pregnant? What Tim is saying, Barrett, is yeah. that's an assumption that you're making. You cannot get that information from the film. No, that's a hundred percent. That's correct. Yeah. yeah, no, so that is, I'm actually like all... Bullshit aside, I'm trying to clarify here. Mm -hmm. In any of the extended canon and anything that we know from this movie or otherwise, are we supposed to be under the assumption that Palpatine is putting these visions into the mind of Anakin about his wife who is pregnant and who is going to die? Yes. Because <laughs> that is, there is anything a lot that confirms of that? Yeah, because there's nothing in this movie that ever gives us any reason to believe that. Is there anything in the extended canon that does? Or is that something that fans are guessing? I this need is, to look. I could have sworn that that was either in okay. a comic or something. I'll, I'll, Got it. I'll, I'll, I'll double check. In my addition source. to this, I mean, I think it's obvious how he would know at least that Padme is pregnant and know to prey on that. It's because he is a significantly stronger and better Force user than all of the Jedi. And when there's a, a Jedi around, in you know, literally. Like in this pregnant woman, he can sense it because Jedi are supposed to be able to. In every reasonable sense, you're supposed to be able to sense when something is changing within the Force. So it would make yeah. perfect. It would it would absolutely explain everything to me. I have no qualms with him being able to identify like she pregnant with some Jedi mm -hmm. from afar, a thousand percent. You could feel that. How every other Jedi in the world currently can't. <laughs> not so much. Right. Um, there are, there are allusions to like in, there was like a book about like the essential guide to the force where it talks about how, how Sidious was sort of giving mall dreams. There was some stuff, okay. um, there was some stuff in the revenge of the Sith novelization where they, they specifically say that like, like Palpatine will say things to Anakin and Anakin will describe it in his head as it sounds like a voice out of my dreams. It sounds like it came to like. So there's there's definitely like there's definitely a lot of stuff and and there's just stuff where like being around the emperor longer and longer it's been shown like will influence you more and more because he does have like yeah. it's like a Jedi mind trick but he can like just subtly just keep keep putting stuff in your head. So, you know. I just feel like I just feel like it would have made a lot of sense in the same way we saw the Yoda confessional if we also saw a confessional with Palpatine. And mm -hmm. then, Ooh. then it's like totally clear. We would totally understand. Oh, he told Palpatine about his dreams. He even told more detail. So he's yeah. telling him that he's scared about the child death because then the Darth Plagueis the Wise conversation makes sense of why he's bringing it up. Like, if something bad would happen, people then they die. We could bring them back. Like otherwise, mm -hmm. that comes out of fucking nowhere. Yeah. But please continue. Um. So meanwhile, in James Cameron's Avatar, uh, <laughs> <laughs> on Kashyyyk. Uh, we see some of these, these are some of my favorites, the Oavar jet catamarans. It's the bug ships that they have on Kashyyyk that look like dragonflies and stuff. Oh, the Tarzan yell. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've got, uh, we've got this, uh, Yoda is kind of watching this, this hologram. And so is Kayati Mundi of Anakin saying, Hey, uh, the chancellor has requested that I lead this campaign to Utapau. And, uh, Everybody's like, uh, the chancellor can get fucked because once again, he's not a member of the council uh, and you just had a hissy fit. Uh, so why don't we, why don't we send Obi-Wan? Why don't we send out Obi-Wan on this one? And Anakin gets a, a little bummed. And then we get to see some of this battle of Kashyyyk where we do get the Tarzan yell of the Wookiees as they swing out over the water. So good. I love this sequence. It's just... 
This is some 1930s, 1940s pulp comic book Republic serial giant freaking Bigfoots against bug robots that float up from the sea. And I love every moment of it. And I, I every love, moment. I love the shot. I remember like learning of the making of shot where all of them like get up. It's just like the same 10 uh, dudes in the same like Wookiee outfits where they would like they would uh, do the reaction and then they would and then move, move over and then do it again and then like move over and do it again. So like all, if I, I if you pause there, you could probably like, oh, yeah, those are like the same 15 Wookiees over and over again, which is just so good. I love it. It looks so good. Uh, we go back. To the, uh, we go back to uh, Anakin and Obi-Wan as Obi-Wan is leaving and Anakin says, hey, I've been arrogant and I apologize. Now, this is basically Anakin not doing any of that. This is Anakin being like, the Emperor is right. He's not the Emperor yet, but I hope one day he will be because you suck. I'm going to find out information <laughs> from you about what you're doing. Uh, but Obi-Wan turns around and says... <laughs> Um, you're, you are strong and wise, Anakin, and I'm proud of you. His last words before seeing him again when he's already turned. His last words to Anakin Skywalker. That's you're, true. Yeah. You're he strong says, and wise. Uh, and he says, goodbye, old friend, may the force, uh, goodbye, old friend, may the force be with you. I think it's like his proper exit. Yep. Like, old friend, stop. My heart. Yeah. I just got chills of you saying that. To Anakin awesome. Skywalker before he meets Darth Vader. Uh, goodbye, old friend is so <clears throat> foreshadowing. Um, and this is where we, this is, man, we get so many Tamora Morrisons in this next shot. That I, oh, I we, oh my it. God, we do. I mean, it's, like, we all just watch Book of Boba Fett, right? So we yeah. are intimately familiar with him in a way that I don't think we ever have been before. <laughs> and seeing this movie, like, right now, I'm like, Whoa, it is a trip and a half, man. Too many Tamora Morrisons. Too many Morrisons. <laughs> um, one of my favorite things about this, you know, this is Obi-Wan's about to uh, take, his little, take his little space scooter into the jump ring. And he does this thing right before he does it where he reaches across his body to hit a switch. And there's something about the way he does it where every time I watch it, I think he's going to pull back a little snack. Like he's not like he's not eating like he's not flipping a switch. He's reaching into like a he's keeping his steering arm and he's reaching and he's going to pick. I just I think Obi-Wan snacks while he's in the ship. I just believe he does. I would. Um, <laughs> uh but I love this. This is we're going. We're going to. We're, we're about to head off to Utapau. He's of course talking to the commander. We've got Commander Cody, who of course becomes one of my favorite characters in all of Star Wars canon, thanks to the Clone Wars. Uh, just a good boy, Commander Cody. Uh, but then we jump, much like we're jumping through a gate and with a jump ring, to Anakin's second dream, where Obi Wan is saying, "Save your strength, Padme." Ooh. What the hell? <laughs> so, so you know, uh, one of the Patreon, uh, one of the trogs in the the, the chat here, uh, was kind of love like, trogs. I feel like they were trying to force this weird love triangle thing, and then someone else responded like, no, there was no way that they were doing that. But there was a little bit of like, you know, the implications that you know the the, the insecurities that you know Anakin has about Obi Wan. And yes. Padme for whatever reason, In general, which I yeah. get because Ewan McGregor's hot. All right, I get it. Ewan but McGregor is very hot and a little hot. more appropriate for Padme. I'm gonna say it. I, he, I think they're right both in the middle. I actually I think, think they're both on the wrong if end. It's, if it's uh, Price's right rules, then she should be with Hayden Christensen. If it's yeah. Hollywood rules, then she goes with <laughs> Ewan. <laughs> they I'll look more like the same age. I'll look um, it up. In episode I'm also looking it up. Uh, she was 14 in episode one, which obviously very, very, very bad. So in Revenge of the Sith, he's 38. <laughs> Jesus. So that means older than I he was I 25 so. then in Phantom Menace. And she was 14. Yeah. So he's 11 years older than her, which like by the time a little bit later, sure. But it's still a little sketchy. Not when you met her when she's 14. But, that's, but that, exactly, that ain't good. Exactly. But it, can't. But it does bring <laughs> into the thing. Of, you're telling me he's 20, 20, whatever, late 20s. 
Uh, or what? How old was he in episode one? Did you just say he was twenty five in Phantom Menace? So that is how three is years older than Anakin old? here. And oh, I hate the way what? they treat ages in the fucking Jedi Council. <laughs> this is all moot because there is no love triangle. There isn't. There is no love triangle. There isn't. Look, but there's, there's a, a weird jealousy. undertone that Lucas was trying to do there, which is super... I agree. I think that there is a a care, though, in the same way that he looks out for Anakin, where he looks out for Padme. And I think he has grave concerns that he could never really voice to Padme at this point that I do appreciate, that I think if is a you, depth of a character. If you think of Anakin as as an addict or somebody that's in trouble and somebody that doesn't want to admit that they are in trouble... And you look, they they are always seeing things in their support system that aren't there, right? They're seeing relationships that aren't there. They're seeing people scheme against them in ways that they aren't. And I think, you know, he wanted this to be his first leadership mission, and it went to Obi-Wan. There's always been a little bit of competition between the two of them. How many times have I saved your life? How many times have I saved yours? That sort of thing. Uh, and then also, like, he's hi he is hiding things from Padme, and I think he feels guilty about that. And so seeing... The idea of the two of them talking freely and opening and open to each other is definitely something that pisses him off. Uh, but I don't think it's a romantic thing at all. Yeah. Um, and he says it. He says, the Jedi Council doesn't trust me. And Padme says, they trust you with their lives. And he is not listening. She is a human sounding board at this point because he's just like, I'm not the Jedi. I should be. I want more and I know I shouldn't. I need to save you. And... I found a way to save you from my nightmares. Yes. <laughs> That's yes. what he says to her. He I will find says, a way That's to like her. an adorable thing you'd hear like a five-year-old say to their parent. Like, I found yeah. a way to save you from my nightmares. Yeah, and then you'd put that kid in therapy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't, no, you can't, you don't have that power. Okay. Um, but uh, she literally, she literally says, this is the, the, the line that I have, that I, ugh. I'm, I'm not going to die in childbirth, Annie. I promise you. No, I promise you. Which at that point. <laughs> so intense. At that point, I feel like she should have gone to someone to be like, yo, Annie's in a yo. fucking way. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's messed up good. But they have reduced her to an opinionless lady. She is now just a baby carrying machine. She is only vehicle for babies at this point. Because now we care about getting Luke and Leia. Padme is no longer relevant to this story. She is simply an object to be lost and a vessel to carry future Jedi. And then die. <laughs> like, that's all the story we have for her, so she has to die. Well, we'll we, and we will definitely oh, I'm, get oh, there. I can't wait to get to that. But also, did y'all know that Utapau is made of bones? That's cool. Mm. Utapau's got, Utapau, they got buildings made of bones. And you can land on them, and you can hang out with them, and you can just, you can hang out with the we dudes with weird teeth and corduroy faces, and they'll come up to you, and you can say, hey, uh, what's up? I'm just wondering if I can, like, uh, if I can hang out and do some stuff for the war. And it's like, hey, there's no war here, buddy unless you brought it with you, and then they're going to lean into you with their weird, pointy, candy corn teeth. Yeah. And they're going to say, he's here on the 10th level. They're all here. Now, Carboni, yes. I feel like we had this conversation maybe in our reactions to the, the Kenobi trailer recently. This is the same, this is the same uh, race of dudes as the race. Grand Inquisitor, right? Yes. Okay. They look a little like, it's, they're made to look insanely untrustworthy, which I find interesting in this scene. For a movie that indicates so much visually, it's so weird because, I mean, and maybe this was by design, but when they're like, oh no, they're here and they're on the 10th floor, you've got to help us. I was like, double crossed. The first time I saw yeah, this movie. No, I mean, the 10th time I saw this movie, I had the same feeling where I was just like, God, there's so much shit of like, Palpatine's clearly the bad guy, but nobody knows it. But this bad looking person is claiming that he's on the inside secretly, but is he really? I don't fucking remember. Well, maybe it'll teach us not to judge alien races by the way they look. How about that? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. maybe. Although you know, they do. Which although is the they opposite do. of what episode one did. <laughs> which got real bad. Um, so they're here. Uh, Obi Wan makes it looks like makes it look like he leaves, but secretly is hanging out just a couple levels below where these bad dudes are, and he's gonna find out 
what's going on, and he's going to do it on his very cool Varactyl that's named Boga. So I, when he gets, is he is he force projecting himself to make it look like he went into the the ship and fly off? I, that's what I always figured because other like because he doesn't jump out of the ship, right? Like you see him get into the his uh, Jedi uh, starfighter. The robot men, the cool looking robot men, are looking down at him in his little Jedi fighter. The thing closes and then he flies off. But then he's it, unless in he his does hood, well incognito. Be- well, it's probably not a force projection because he, he doesn't that know that Grievous is there for sure. So maybe he does like jump out of the ship when no one's looking. I don't maybe know. He does like, cool lands Jedi it somewhere flip. else. Yeah, my thought is he see, just takes. Well, you see, see him like right off, after like, it takes off, straight away. Yeah, I mean, as soon as it takes off. Yeah, it cuts to him watching it take off. But you know, right? Like he's toy. He has the conversation. No, I get what the, you're saying. The teeth yeah. men, and yeah. they tell him, "Hey, Grievous is here." What right. if it's like the you know in Thor uh, Ragnarok, right, where they're about to go get the ship um, from? It's a uh, Loki thing. Yeah, where Loki kind of like you see him keep walking, but then you see his real self like run away. So I yeah, wonder but if that doesn't like that. exist, right? Like, there's no force projection until. Luke and Last Jedi, right? Like, but there's that's, no that's, other uh, moment. Uh, force projection. Luke wasn't the one, I think, that really like founded that idea. Was uh, there a, in any instance before not, Last Jedi? Did we see film. that? Because like Luke not did it, film. and we no. saw Ray and um, Kylo, Kylo kind of have their little moments and stuff. But like, I feel like that's when force projection. Well, they were a dyad. That's a that's a different situation, Tim. <laughs> you're you're right. Excuse me. Excuse me. It was a dyad. <laughs> I love these movies. Uh, so, uh, on his Varactyl named Boga, uh, he starts starts sliming around on his good little lizard. He's riding a Gex around on Utapau on the Bones planet. He's got a lizard in the planet of Bones, and he rides up into the rafters where all the bad boys are meeting. And uh, General Grievous is like, yo, we're taking you all to Mustafar. And they're like, we're not going to Mustafar. What are you talking about, dude? Like, we're staying right here. He's like, hey, eat shit. You're going to Mustafar. And that's what we say. And it's like, okay. Uh, Obi-Wan is hanging out. Boga is like doing cute shit in the background. And this, I just love whole, how much. This scene here to me is like mm-hmm. this movie in general, I think is is extra, right? Everything about it is extra. We'll get to the, the final fight later. We'll talk a lot about that. Um, but even the opening scene of this, the star fight, the, the gravity, all that stuff we're talking about, like they're like, when we have set pieces, we're going to go all out. And like, we're really going to do any possible thing that we can to like make this cool, 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 more cool, more cool, more cool. There's something about this scene that I'm very torn on where I, of course it's iconic. Of course we get the hello there. We get Grievous with the, you know, do the jump rope, uh, lightsabers and all that stuff. Like there's a lot of stuff, but I feel like they missed the mark overall in, they tried making this scene too cool. And if they had done less, I think it would have been way cooler actually. Like having Obi-Wan on the, the, the lizard guy, uh, what's his name again? Boga. Boga, like seeing on Boga, but then they also have the like the spinny wheel things, and then there's also Grievous, and then there's also like there's just like too many factors at play that I think it it starts turning into just CG noise as opposed uh, opposed to like choreographed action that the rest of the movie I think has a better balance of. Mm, that's interesting. I completely disagree. Um, <laughs> 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 Everything from Boga in the rafters to the motherfucking hello there, to the two-finger Kenobi point, to, whoops, turns out I have forearms you didn't know about, motherfucker. And I'm oh, just like so that. Good. In these real fast. Oh, everything just, about just, this we is need great. To, we just need to just take a moment and just really soak into the I- yes, iconic. Yes, thank you. Hello there. Hello there. <laughs> so good. This yeah, show. I agree. That's, that's the iconic scene. It has some weak moments of CGI, but like, I don't care. I don't care, dude. That's, that's Man, a course, like, very CGI heavy one, and it's 2005. Full pass for me. Our lost hand count goes up to four, yeah. which is such a good thing for Star Wars. Uh, I Look, the Force, the Force Saber moment gets memed to hell, but it's so fucking cool. You get Cody and the troops dropping in. You get like those close-up shots of their eyes when they're fighting like a samurai movie. 
Like it goes totally Yojimbo. And the amount when, like, of Grievous... unnecessary detail in Grievous's eyes as well. It's one of those oh, shots that's so still tired. Barrett. To this he's day, so tired. seventeen years later, you're like, God damn, they put a lot of I... body into that shot. <laughs> I think they did Ewan McGregor a little dirty on the fight training, the lack thereof. Yeah. Um, I true. am of the opinion that he did his damnedest and he still looks very cool in many areas. Uh, but I do think that they could have um, taught him a little bit of like sword training, lightsaber training to make him look very cool during this and there are definitely moments where like that opening as soon as the four lightsabers comes out and he like strikes his saber back where he looks a little dorky uh in moments that could have been very cool for me i understand i know <laughs> but two it's fingers. a moment that could have been very very cool if it was like properly choreographed and it's a it's a little clunky a little dorky i'll say this i love it you, but it could have been better when you look at when you look at ewan's fighting against human opponents who are there in this film i think he's very good i think he had the training i think it's probably weird to fight a cg thing that isn't there and yes they they could have they there's they probably could have done some stuff to clean that up. In well, their, their answer to it was to yeah. put him in more CG things like the lizard and the spinning wheel thing. And I think that's a disservice to this because like Yo. as cool as the four sabers are, they don't do anything cool with it. He does his little spinny thing and then they go yeah. away. It's like Darth Maul. It's like, oh, shit. He has two lightsabers. What are they going to do? We get a whole ass fight seeing what he can what they what's going down with that dual sided lightsaber. Yeah. Whereas with Grievous, it's like he has four lightsabers. Oh, he has two lightsabers. You know what I mean? It's like over that quickly spins them very fast like no one can timothy <laughs> it's very <laughs> cool it is very cool um and also i love when grievous jumps on his cool fucking one wheel and they have a ben her about it like i like when they have a ben her about it i think and he drops his saber and like fucking cody is just like huh found a saber like <laughs> i love it so i good. love it so much because it gives us it gives us a moment later on that's so good right before order 66 um so then we get to uh uh we get to mace windu uh talking to yoda who is of course not there they're all talking they're like hey i sense a plot to destroy the jedi no way uh the dark side <laughs> of the force surrounds the chancellor yeah. you don't say <laughs> And Yoda goes, whoa, 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 to a dark place this line of thought will take us. And he's speaking specifically about, be careful before you say we are going to seize power and we're going to seize this government because that could backfire on us in a big, big way. Yep. And does um, Mace Windu take any of that in when he thinks about that? When, he, when Yoda says that, does he really really digest Maybe. any of you know his Dumb. good friend yona's words no, a little he does i look, couldn't tell look <laughs> honestly because his good friend yoda who he's been yeah. good friends with as yeah. as far as we know from the movies uh -huh. at least yeah. 13 years and yeah. his good friend yoda of 13 years right. at least says hey uh -huh. yes you got to make right. the right steps and not be hasty True. about yes possibly seizing power from this possibly very evil man in control of the entire galactic republic yeah and then 30 now, minutes later mace windu barges into that man's room and is like under order of the galactic senate you are under arrest okay now there's You're a difference <laughs> between arresting the chancellor and seizing power over all government True. if there's a bad man in the government and you arrest him and you go, okay, Senate, go about your business. Who takes over for the chancellor? Who's, who's vice chancellor? Oh, what happened to vice chancellor Valorum? Okay, we don't talk about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think we don't know that Mace Windu was rolling in there to take over the government. He was rolling in there to get rid of a Sith Lord. And I think that's two different things. Uh, but speaking of our buddy, the chancellor, while all this is going on, he's just chilling looking at his evil red screen, which is probably fine. He's the only person that has a red screen. Pondering There's nothing wrong with big it. big old orb on that red he's, screen. Yeah, he's either pondering an orb or looking at his nightmarish red screen. And Anakin walks in and is just like, hey, Obi-Wan is on Utapau. I should be there with him. 
There are things about the force that they're not telling me. And he says, hey, let me put aside my red screen that's of no consequence. And let's take another walk, you and me, buddy. Let's walk down my cool hallway while I talk about like, hey, you know, I studied the force a little bit back in school in my wilder days. Before I was a politician, I was a little bit of a, a little bit of a party guy. And I did a little force. Everybody does a little force when they're young. Uh, and I know some stuff. And, you know, here's the thing. Uh, the Jedi have a very limited view of the force, man. Like you, if you're going to understand all of the force, don't you need to learn a little bit about what the evil side of the force is thinking? You got you to gotta take a larger view of this whole thing, man. You got to hear both sides. You can't just ban people on Twitter for spreading racist misinformation. You got to hear them out. Otherwise, it's not free speech. And Anakin goes, hey, wait a minute. Are you the Sith Lord, though? <laughs> <laughs> after all, after everything. Hang now on just, a minute. Now wait. just wait a minute. Are you the Sith Lord? Uh, and he goes, well, you know, hey, I do know how to save how to save your wife and i'm the only one that could do it what do you want what do you want to do well do you want to kill me i yes i i really want to he's like i knew you would i could feel your anger it gives you focus <laughs> <laughs> i fucking love mcdermott There's in this scene no explanation for why his voice does that and it's so funny like that's not a complaint of mine no it is good. a passionate love for this but it is nonsensical there is no possible way to explain why that would ever happen. If that um, was like, if the voice had been taken on after the lightning and it's like, oh, it just like corroded his insides in a weird way. And now he talks like this. It does the thing. I would be like, yeah, OK, sure. Yeah, it did it to his face. It did it to his voice. No problem. But before that, he just randomly all of the time. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> he's just, and he's also he also has started doing his little his little T-Rex emperor arms that I really love, when he gets really evil, he's like, yes, yes, I'm just a little waddling guy. I'm just a little guy. Don't worry about me. Something um, about the way that he does it that is just a little guy and occasionally borders on, like, bashful evil is yeah. my favorite alignment I've ever heard of. He's very, I, I just love he's very that, uwu about yeah, it. Yeah, totally. But I love that Palpatine Ooh. slash uh, Darth Sidious in the, in the prequel movies, especially yeah. this movie, and the robot chicken iteration of Palpatine are like obviously far off and that's a joke. Uh -huh. They're a lot closer than they should be. You know what I mean? Yeah, I love it. I I love it so much. Um, they're doing a lot of circle walking here. I actually like the way this is this is this is shot. I think this is directed very Shakespearean as well. You know, this is this is uh, Mercutio and Tybalt just walking yeah. around each other in circles. 100%. I I genuinely enjoy it. It's very theatrical. Um, this is when we do get the majority of the uh, dinosaur one wheel uh, fight, uh, including uh, you want to talk about how this movie goes some violent places. When when Obi-Wan figures out that there's a beating heart under a single plate of metal <laughs> and he's just like, I'm going to open you up and I'm going to take that. Yeah, mine now. <laughs> and I'm just trying to understand of like when Grievous was, you know, designing his you know, second body as like this dying alien man who wanted to keep living, but you know, I, I think was like sick. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Why would he have like even just like a, any sort of little open area that would expose his heart? Like why, it's not sanitary. Why? I can tell you that much. Oh, 100%. To have Rogue, Rogue Two, a movie's going to come out that's going to explain yeah. exactly why all that. Yeah, thing. exactly. Um, I believe th I think they talk about it a little bit in Clone Wars. Actually, how he built they, himself they, up because they go. The lair, like Grievous's lair, his underground oh, horror cave. So cool! It, Those episodes it's a are so good. very frightening episode, and it's yeah. very good. Um, then we uh, then we cut to uh, Anakin telling Mace what's up, mm -hmm. and he's and, and Mace is like, "I am jumping in. I am going to take this guy out." Anakin's like, "Yeah, me too." And he's like, "No, I don't think you should be near this guy. Just it's it's. I'm jumping in. I'm going to take this guy out." <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the, there's the, no emotion. The no, when uh, Anakin's like, let me come with you. And they had to get Samuel L. Jackson to dub over whatever his original take was when he says no, because the audio and his 
lips are not in sync in that shot. And they had to get a cut of him where he's turning and saying no, which has driven me insane since I first saw this movie 17 17 years. years. (laughs) Even as a weird little child who focused on that little detail where I was like, he didn't actually just say that word. He didn't actually Um, just say that word. He had to go no in a very monotone way because whatever take he said before saying the word no wasn't even good enough for that. Uh, I'm he with tells, you, He tells Anakin, hey, listen, once you will, if this is true, you will have, you know, I, you will have earned my trust. This is, this is good. Like, mm-hmm. this is, you did a good thing. But, you know, he's doing it in his very cold Mace Windu way. And Anakin is just, he just wants to be told he's a good boy. And only Palpatine is doing that right now. And it's a problem. Uh, so this is where we get, uh, the very good lightning fight. Uh, oh, okay, that's what, yeah, thank you. Thank you for calling it that. <laughs> it's the very good lightning fight. Um, it's after a moment with Padme, but yeah, it, they never made it matter. Yeah. <laughs> Where they kind of, yeah. she kind of feels him. when She's at home and he's in the Jedi Council room. Yeah. And he's thinking about and, her. And then I think it also cuts to Palpatine at one point be like, <laughs> No, yeah. you're adding that. You're okay. adding that to your mind. <laughs> yeah, no. that's just okay. in there. Well, I don't even want to get to the very cool but, lightning fight because yeah. they, he's straight, you know, like they come in. There's the coolest shot ever of like uh, them walking into uh, Palpatine's room that I yeah. re- distinctly remember when the first trailer came out and you saw that shot and you were like, oh. Oh, shit's shit. about to go yeah, down yeah. in this movie, Which, and it's like, yes. Very cool there. And yeah. Palp- Palpatine also, you know, I understand Ian McDermott been playing Palpatine since yeah. 83. Is that correct? 83, I want to say. Yeah. He's an old dude, so naturally they're not going to be able to give him like proper fight choreography, but at least. You know, give me a little bit of CG Duke, a little bit more of CG Dooku there. So when he's cutting down all of these Jedi who are like on the Jedi Council, Jedi Masters, when he slices them down each time, in my head I don't go, that wasn't earned. That was weird. Mm. They should have blocked that. What, what's going on here? Interesting. Disagree. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, you know what? And like, I'm playing things in the background as we do this too, and I'm like, I. The first jump spin looks silly, but like of oh, course it does. Most spin. of the like jumps the jump in this spin. are very silly. His motherfucking like, I'm fine M with it. Bison, his M Bison Psycho Crusher. But he's I pretty love it with that saber, honestly. Oh, and when they do, because and when they do the pretty smooth. When they do the inserts of McDermott, and he's making like the he's making like the vampire face and doing like the downward slash. Oh, I, those I think it's shots so cool. are great, but the, the who's the green guy with the the long ten? Why am I blanking? Uh, it's name? Kit Fisto. Kit Fisto, thank you. Yeah. When he strikes down the boy, Kit who Fisto, at that shot where he like strikes it, like it doesn't even look like Kit Fisto got hit with anything. He was like, ah, oh, I got like a weird heart palpitation. I'm gonna go lie down for a little bit, you know. Yeah. Like, I will say though, there's like specifically a shot where he's fighting Windu and he does the like double double backflip thing, which again is like very CGI or whatever, but he does a very cool landing and he slashes his lightsaber back and that's what shatters the window right there. And that's like cool. old guy it's looks epic. badass. Yeah. Like yeah, that was sure. cool as hell. And like his stance in it was really good. Like Ian McDermott crushed that landing Crush and just like it. just the power in it was everything yeah. to me. Of course, uh, I mean, it It starts with another great McDermott quote, the I am the Senate, not yet. Um, now, Windu has the upper hand and says, you know, you're under arrest. And he just screams, you will die. <laughs> you will die. And he's just using his lightning. And Anakin comes in and Windu is like, he's too dangerous to be left alive. Remember, this is something that Anakin did himself yeah. in the beginning of this film. And immediately says, ooh, that was wrong. I probably shouldn't have done that. And remember, this is somebody, the Chancellor now is somebody that Anakin doesn't just see as a friend. Anakin protects his friends. But he also sees as somebody who has the key to stop his nightmares. Uh, (laughs) And so there's no way Anakin is going to listen. But what I think, what I love about this is he's literally firing out so much lightning out of his hands that like Mace Windu is like falling backwards. But he's doing this voice. He's like, oh, I'm so weak. 
I'm so weak, Anakin, help me. I'm so weak, he's going to hurt me. And I just love the way McDermott plays it. And I love that Anakin is so blinded at this point that that's all Palpatine needs to do. Yeah. But yeah, there's like the on worst, his side. No. the worst yeah. bad acting. I'm so oh, oh, I'm so, I'm so weak. I'm falling and I can't get up. And yeah, See, it's so. I, good. I'm, I'm I, obviously I fucking love the scene. It's ridiculous yeah. and it's the stupidest yeah. best thing ever. But yeah. like going back to the why they had to do this, and it's like we, the fact that they had to disfigure his face, and this is the way they decided to do it. I think is so bad on so many levels. Specifically, <laughs> just looking at this scene, why? Would that be part of this Palpatine's plan? Like, if we didn't know that he had to get disfigured, mm -hmm. why would he decide, I'm going to obviously be the one shooting the lightning out and have Mace Windu be at me and be like, oh, it hurts, I, don't, I can't do it. It's like, there's so many other plans you could have had that didn't uh -huh. involve disfiguring yourself. No, I don't think you face shooting fucking was part of lightning. the plan. Yeah, no, I, also I don't, don't think, think he was pulling out think... all of the cards that he had up his sleeve because, you know, I, I, he, I don't think I mean, he fully expected remember, to be in that moment. Mace Windu got the upper hand, which, which I don't think Palpatine saw coming. Yeah. And I think that he just used his greatest, his best defense and was trying to keep Windu from killing him. Yeah. Just long enough to get Anakin to kill Mace Windu. See, because if so Anakin fired, had not shown up, like it, Palpatine would have died. I think, but, I think that would have been the end of Palpatine. Yeah, uh, okay. I mean, I guess that, that adds up. Because the thing that I don't buy, though, is later when he's, like, in the Senate or whatever the fuck, and he's talking to everybody. He's like, they just figured me. And I guess that couldn't have been part Maybe of the plan. Maybe that's just jazz. But just, yeah. But I just, yeah. That's no, just I hate, jazz. You know, Greg this Miller. entire thing. You know, Greg is, oh, Miller. It's all part of the plan. It's all part of the plan. You know, he, he, it's like, it wasn't. It's he's like when we planned Star Wars Episode Three uh, rewatch for May 18th, and then we didn't realize until this Monday, hey, the 17th anniversary is tomorrow, you know? It's just, yeah. he fell into a lucky kind of thing where I was like, I'm going to play off of this. And He's like, you know, oh, what happened to your sympathy. face? Oh, dude, the Jedi did this to me. Yeah, oh, I, boy. I, I do have a question about the disfigurement. Um, if that is the effect of the lightning hitting somebody, mm. A, we never see it do that to somebody again, even though we do see lightning again, uh, is including immediately when he finally hits Mace Windu with the lightning, and instead we see Mace's skull show through his body for some reason, which doesn't happen when the lightning hits Palpatine, yeah. only happens when it hits Mace Windu, but Mace does not have the same effect on like the aging of his face very rapidly, uh, which is kind of funny. Sustained, I would say it's sustained lightning yeah. over a period was, of time. But he that, holds that it for a it. while. But also, yeah. do we want to factor in that this could possibly not be actual Palpatine, but a clone of Palpatine. No, and like... get fucked. I'm moving on. <laughs> get fucked. I'm moving on. Yeah, uh, yeah we gotta wrap uh, this up, man. <laughs> uh, so we have our fifth lost hand. We have the screaming of unlimited power. Uh, and what have I done? You're fulfilling your destiny. Hey, look. It's like, okay, I'll serve you. You can be my master. I swear that I will serve you. You'll you'll make sure she doesn't die. You'll bring her back to life. And this is where, this is where Palpatine goes, hey, baby, bubby. <laughs> I don't know how to do it. But, you know, if the two of us work together, I'm, I'm sure we'll, sure figure, it we'll figure it out. And I think this is where you do get some, you do get some solid performance, I think, from Hayden here where he's like, oh, I fucked myself and this is where I am now. Yep. And I have, no, like, I have no choice. He's probably, I don't know if he's ever going to do this, but this is where I am and this is who I am, you know? Um, now, Yoda is feeling the carnage here. Uh, and this is where we get, uh, this is where we get order order sixty six. This yeah. is where it happens. Got it, dude. One of the this is where one of the happened. most amazing cinematic moments of all yeah. time. I don't give a shit about quality. I don't give a shit about anything. Order sixty six is fucking awesome. And, and in the same way, music. the MCU has the snap. This yeah. this is a moment that like has Great. affected the rest of Star Wars. I think for the better. And the more we go back and see this moment from different perspectives, the cooler it becomes. Yeah. So he sends, you know, he sends Anakin to the Jedi Temple. And he says, once more, the Sith will rule the galaxy. Once more, the Sith shall rule the galaxy. Rule and we will the have, galaxy. And, and we will have peace. And I love the way he says it. McDermott crushes. Um, so now we're, we see Kashyyyk and we see the temple at the same time, which, which I love. Uh, we're seeing like the teddy bears, the spider robots. We're seeing Yoda actually feel the destruction mm -hmm. of the light. And it's throwing off his performance in this battle. At the same time, we're seeing Anakin and the clone troopers 
go in and and do this, do this moment. Um, I'll say it's not the kid's fault. The kid was very young, but I I've never enjoyed the performance of the youth who says who who says Master Anakin, what do we do? What you know, do we do? like yeah. <laughs> it's not the kid's fault. The kid was a kid. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lucas doesn't know how to direct you, adults. Like, he's not going to know how to direct this, kids. For two hours and 15 minutes, every single thing Carbo is like, I fucking love it. I fucking love it. We get to and this kid. Five year old. No, not good enough. <laughs> this is where I draw the line on acting yeah. performance. This did not yeah. meet my Shakespearean expectations of episode three of Star Wars. I'm just going to say it. This dude's on, on Samuel L. Jackson's level. Wow. Uh, wow. He, he, there's not as much life in that line as Samuel brings for the rest of it. So now, I'm fine with it. Well, but what I'm going to say is I don't, I, I, I feel like they should have given that kid another take. I feel like that kid was just like nervous and he's a kid. But yeah. what I do like is when Anakin saber ignites, I've always liked the scared little jump. Oh, stumble yeah. back. Like, it's almost like very that, impactful. It, it, like mm -hmm. the, the, how they did it, it's almost like they didn't tell him. That they were gonna like make a loud noise and they got uh -huh. his like actual yeah, cause, reaction. Because we know the kid's a bad actor. <laughs> <laughs> it's a genuine scared baby oh, moment. Uh, uh, see, and it makes this next scene even harder. Yeah. Mm. Um, I will say, you know, Anakin leaves the clone troopers to actually fight Jedi's and he just like goes in to mow down some kids. And I feel like that's not good management. I'm just uh, gonna yeah. go ahead and say that. No. Um I, will I say, do not remember how graphic the mowing down of the children was. And maybe I'm just graphic. a more sensitive bean than I used to be. But I was like, damn, y'all really showed a bunch of kid bodies. Okay. This is one of those things where this movie goes up and down between like the silliness and the like extreme darkness in a way that like I don't think any other Star Wars movie does. Um, Bail Organa tries to see what's up. He's asked to leave. And Jet Lucas, George's is that his son, name? That's Jet oh, Lucas, oh, George's wow. son, who comes oh. out as the as the Jedi, a teenager who mows down those uh, clone troopers and tries to let Bail Organa get away. And then Bail Organa watches the kid get shot. That's Jet Lucas. Bail Organa is like, hey, you'll be hearing from me and <laughs> flies away. Uh, what we have not seen throughout this movie, another thing that got cut, is there have been multiple meetings between Bail Organa, Mon Mothma, Padme, um, all about like, hey, what's going on with the Senate and should something be done? Yeah. Uh, and it is the beginning, like Mon Mothma really talks about starting the rebellion here in this movie and all that stuff got cut, unfortunately. Yeah, and it, it does feed into, you know, and uh, some interesting things of, of them being like, we can't tell anybody outside of this room, which, you know, feeds in, an interesting thing other layer to Padme being like, we can't keep secrets from each other. Um, mm -hmm. There's also just the the aspect of her kind of, and this is something that was built up in the, the Clone Wars show where she had friends that were separatists and stuff like yeah. that. And just like having converse, secret conversations with More them of that context and, would, yeah. have, would have added some depth to that, to that relationship, I think. Yeah. Um, we get Obi-Wan surviving and he sees that the that something's up with the clones, including the good clone who gave him, Commander Cody gave him his lightsaber back. What's going on, Cody? You gave me my lightsaber. Are we yeah. cool? No. Uh, then, we, of course, uh, Chewbacca New Yoda. Chewbacca New Yoda, everybody. That Wookiee, that Wookiee's name was Bill Gates. <laughs> <laughs> That Wookiee's name was Chewbacca. Uh, and yes, you're right. I don't know that that was one that we needed. It, it would have been nice to see Chewbacca during the Battle of Kashyyyk. I don't know that it needed to be called out by thank you, my friend. But I like that we saw that Chewbacca was at the Battle of Kashyyyk. Uh, yeah. Bail, Bail Organa is like, I'm gonna, we got to save some Jedi. Obi-Wan says the same thing. Um, now, this is where we get the conversation between Padme and Anakin where it's like, Padme... You should have done something a little earlier, I think. And and Padme would have done something a little earlier if she had been the Padme from previous films. Yeah. Yes. Um, I saw Master Windu try to assassinate the Chancellor myself. My my loyalties lie with the Chancellor and the Senate and you. The end. In that order. Uh, yeah. In that <laughs> order. Uh, my it three is. biggest loves. Uh, have faith, my love. Everything will soon be set straight. And, you know, all I kept thinking during this scene was this woman is a queen and a senator, and she would not be, she's been in battle. She was in the Battle of Naboo. 
she's she's she got she got crop topped in an in an arena. Like she's been in the shit, and I just I don't like the way she acts in this scene. That's all. Uh, 3PO shows up because he's trying to help. Yeah. Not enough 3PO in this movie. And R2 uh, is uh, obviously beeping and booping like, Anakin's going fucking crazy. And 3PO's <laughs> like, yeah, it sounds hard, dude. That's like that, good. there's very obviously like a subtle moment where you could read into like R2 being like, shit's bad. Shit's mm -hmm. real bad. Yeah. Uh, because all of this, uh, all of this deception came from the Jedi, there's a beacon at the Jedi temple that's telling all Jedi to immediately return to the temple. And so Obi-Wan and Yoda are going to be like, no, 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 strike that, reverse it. Uh, then we cut to Mustafar. It's unpleasant. Uh, this looks like a place that could have a fortress for a big evil guy. Yeah. Uh, the Separatist leaders are all there. Darth Sidious gets on, the, uh, gets on the holophone and is just like, hey, don't worry. My new guy, he's going to come. And he will, and he doesn't just say, my new guy's going to come and take care of you. He McDermott's it. He's like, my new guy will come and he will take care of you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I had to pause the movie at this moment. And I was like, holy shit, that is so evil. And then I thought about, I'm like, hey, from the other side, if they trusted him, it doesn't sound that evil. From your point of view, yeah. the Separatist <laughs> leaders are evil. Um, so uh, then, uh, you know, we get a we get a message from the chancellor's office, and it's like, hey, we got to go meet with the chancellor. And it's like, well, what if the chan what's going on here? Don't worry, the chancellor can't seize power. If he really wants to, he'll need to keep the Senate intact. He can't do it without the Senate. Obi Wan, you sweet dumb mustache. You. I mean, but it does <laughs> doesn't it take him twenty years to do it without the Senate, though? I mean. Yeah, kind of, but also it does like he's got the Senate immediately. Like That's we're true. about to see how much he's got the Senate. Oh yeah. Oh, you're, you're muted. muted. You're muted. I am muted. You're absolutely correct. Go. This Senate scene has the greatest line in all of the prequels, in my opinion. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. It um, is my favorite thing. Yeah. Uh we go back to Mustafar. R2 stay with the ship. I don't want you to see what I'm about to do. Uh oh good, you're here, Lord Vader. Whoop! Whoop! Murder. <laughs> uh, Dude, and then welcome, Lord Vader. We've been yeah, expecting you. Uh, oh, that's, so cool. oh. that's really cool. It's so good. Uh, we get Obi Wan and Yoda wreck and shop a little bit against some clone troopers. This was a much more extended scene originally. And then in the Senate, the Chancellor's like, "Look, the Jedi. They fucking suck. Look what they did to my face. We got to do something." They are ruining everybody. They're rebelling. This is terrible. Are we good with just letting me have all the power unquestionably? And literally everyone's cool with it. Nobody yeah. even wants to raise their hand and bring up some other motion. Like, do we really want to give everybody every, like, no, it's cool. We're good. Uh, but Padme, but except Padme. for Padme, sitting up there, stares at him, say all of the rest of the Jedi will be hunted and killed. And this line that, I just, I don't care like how overused it is. She looks out and she says, this is how Liberty dies with thunderous applause. And with the delivery that you would expect yes! from her. Yes. The, with, yes! The, with the gist of just sheer disbelief and uh, like, I, uh, I'm exhausted. I can't, yeah. Be, uh, fuck. Yeah. You know, and um, that's I wanted why her, no one, you the rest know, of this movie, man. That's why no one raises their hands because of how many people are just like, woo, yeah, you know. Keep state, they got laser swords and they did that to his face, you yeah. know. Yep. Um, so uh, Obi-Wan and Yoda go to the temple and everyone's dead, even the younglings. And poor Obi-Wan, who, who could have done this, he says. He knows. God, and In that's the back another of one of those mind, real graphic ones where it's just like, there's kids. Yeah. Um, is is this the scene where he goes? Anakin's, Anakin's the father, isn't he? No, that's what uh, this started. comes soon. Yeah, because yeah. uh, that is but, awesome. Uh, we go to um, Lord Sidious promised us peace as uh, Lord Vader destroys everyone. Obi Wan recalibrates the code uh, and he says, "We got to figure out who did this." And Yoda goes, "If into the security recordings you go, only pain you will find." Now, Yoda, I understand what you're saying. 
but also that's poor detective work and it's not the best thing to do in this situation. You should know who killed the Jedi because you're going to have to deal yeah, with it. What was his goal there, you know? Yeah. Was he just going to like pretend for with Obi-Wan for the rest of their lives like, ah. It could have been know. anyone, really. Could have been anybody. I know it wasn't you because I was with you and you know it wasn't me, but above and beyond that. Um, but, you know, I... I think at this point, I've always watched this scene with the subtext of Obi-Wan knows and Yoda's like, yeah. don't watch it. Don't right. watch it, man. Um, and so Yoda, uh, Obi-Wan says, send me to kill the emperor. I will not kill Anakin. He's like my brother. I can't do it. And Yoda goes, dude, you think you're going to fight Lord Sidious? Get out of here. Go kill your little brother. I got <laughs> real shit to take care of. Come on. Um, Obi, then this is where Obi-Wan talks to Pat. But also, but even with what you just said, though, Carboni, can we yeah. think about it for just a second? I know we're going long, and I apologize. I apologize so much to everyone involved, specifically to Sage, because she has not been on an interview with Carboni before, so she doesn't, she didn't know. Yeah. She didn't know. I fucking love it, though. This is fantastic. She was on, that. she was on the spider, she was on the spider boys, no way home. She knows. No, I was not. <laughs> but, well, I guess not, we did the one after yeah. the fact on yeah, YouTube. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I also so do a show the, with Anthony three days a week. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, 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 I fucking. I, I this is a blast. But um, you just said that Yoda's like, yo, I'm gonna handle Sidious. You, you handle the little brother. We just talked for two hours and twenty six minutes about the fact that they don't know who Darth Sidious is. Like, they don't, Yoda doesn't understand this shit. Like, it's such a weird jump to. I guess now, oh, he has all this power. I'll take care of him. And it's like, maybe we should. Well, have they, well he's they had see, enough power they see the, to fog their, you know, their, their yeah, minds And they about. see the security recording, not just of the younglings, but of Mace Windu. So they see the, they see the Windu battle and they know. Yeah. Yes. Um, you're right. Yeah. You're right. So, um, you know, uh, this is where Obi-Wan talks to Padme and Padme is still in so much denial at this point. Uh, this is where we get the famous killing younglings uh, line where famously Ewan McGregor says that he did this with his hand because he was chuckling because he couldn't deliver the line. Um, oh I don't know if that's <laughs> I don't know if that's real or if that's just a I, thing that he said a couple times. I could I could imagine it, especially with, you know, often things are filmed out of order. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't you're not feeling the same weight of uh, uh of recording a scene especially when it's all cgi stuff and as like not what not is it line yeah and like the way because <laughs> the way it's worded and because george lucas is a you know a robot with human flesh with the like killing Gotta younglings who <laughs> says that yeah um well apparently obi-wan does and uh padme says you're gonna kill him aren't you and he says listen he's He's very, he's very dangerous. Like, that's all he says. He doesn't say no. Mm -hmm. um, and so she's like, I'm not going to tell you where he is. We get the first shot of Vader overlooking Mustafar from what's going to become his ding-dang castle right before, and it's a dope shot, right yeah. before 3DO, uh, 3PO and Padme go off to Mustafar with Obi-Wan hiding inside because he's like, I know where you're going. I know exactly where you're going. Um, Anakin's not feeling great about what's going on, but his buddy, the Emperor, says you have restored peace and justice to the, val to the galaxy. You did it. A ship appears on the uh, on the instruments. Well, also, it, hey, shut down all the droids, please. Because we oh need, yeah, we need to shut uh, shut them down, please. Because they're not in the original trilogy. So please, holy shit, it was Carbonia droid. We shut down oh my <laughs> god. <laughs> 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 But from here on out, this movie is just so ridiculous. Like it's it just is. like it's all, it's all caps. Like yeah, it, it's it, like I hey, agree. Star Wars was subtly anime before this, but now it's anime. Yeah, yeah it now is. it's anime. Uh, so he runs out to see her as she lands. They run to each other. Now this is this is a cut that I am really bummed about. I originally. Padme goes to talk to Anakin and their conversation goes much as it does in this movie. Um, you know, only my new powers can save you. I'm doing it to protect you. Uh, we can live on my cool lava planet. We don't have to run. Look how cool this lava planet is. It's dope. Um, uh, and when she finally sees what he's become, she pulls a knife on him and she tries to stab him. She tries to be the one to destroy Darth Vader, uh, injures him, and it's his injury 
originally that allows Obi-Wan to win the duel. Sick. I love Would have been that. so cool. Wow. Why do we give her nothing instead? Because she's already, you know, she's <laughs> already the plot device of why Anakin's so moody. She's already carrying this. You want her to have a third thing to do in this movie, Sage? <laughs> you mean beyond the motivation of a man? <laughs> uh, and no. the motivation of the future man? <laughs> Obi-Wan comes out from hiding. Anakin flips out. I knew you were all against me. Uh, I think nails that scene, by the way. She does. She yeah. really I nails think she it. Does. I, I think she nails you, that. I don't I love know you. you. You know, right before she, like, he force jokes her. Uh, uh huh. Heartbreaking. Oh, right? and the look on her, and the her, look her, on her face. Away. Please, I love you. And her voice just, like, disappears in it. And you're just like, ah! Uh, it's, it's so rough. He throws her aside, you know. The Jedi turned against me. Don't you turn against me? You know, and then he sees Obi Wan. You did this, and Obi Wan throws down his robe and is just like, "You have done that yourself." Let's an icon go. Um, <laughs> I deflect all responsibility onto you mm -hmm. yourself. Could I have been a better dad? Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this is where we go back and forth between. These very good duels. Um, you know, the Yoda duel, I think, is is so great. Like, Yoda versus Sidious, there's something cool. It's so on the nose. The symbolism in this movie is so on the nose. But rising up in the Senate pod into the Senate chambers and having their fight in the empty chambers because the government isn't needed anymore and they're just throwing, like, it's so good. Good, man. It is so uh, on the nose, I think, is the best way to put it. And when you just go all in and you're like, they went all in, just enjoy it for being all in. It's so fucking great. Like the intercut between the, the battle of the heroes and then like the, the duel of the fates music playing. We get Yoda versus Palpatine. It's like it's fan service at its best. But I think that it's hilarious that they're just like, you know what? The the stakes, how high can we turn them? Mm -hmm. Higher 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 when you look at the mustafar battle it's like every single second they're like how much more dangerous can we make it let's make yeah. the platform smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller let's throw even more crazy shit at them like i'm surprised that at some point there weren't like the first resident evil or like uh, mm. mission impossible like lasers <laughs> that they also would have yeah. to dodge like it's so fucking funny make yeah. it a full-on video game and have random trains <laughs> coming at each other and you know, they <laughs> crash into each other when they exactly. come at each other. But also like to that effect him of, you know, like they've got the shields that protect all of like their, their buildings and equipment from the lava. And that gets turned off of like, just like all the little things where it's like, this is getting so They ridiculous. almost hold hands at one point. They get real <laughs> they close do. to holding and hands. And that's why <laughs> Carboni, I'm gonna let you know that shot, that beautiful shot where they're holding the hands, their heads are almost kind of together. That mm -hmm. shot in and of itself was what sparked my theory of why Rey was, in fact, a Kenobi. Because Rey and Kylo also do the hand-holding thing in um, Force do. Awakens. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my God, it's poetry. Speaking and then they, of they didn't hand do stuff, which I hate the transition. <laughs> <It's so laughs> <good. laughs> I said what I said. I think the reason people are always losing hands in this is because they fight with one flailing hand. I think this upcoming battle between Anakin and Obi-Wan is incredible. I think it's the best fight throughout this movie. I think it's wonderful. The choreography's better. Obi-Wan's better than he was in the last one. Like, it's clean and it moves quickly but man like and, and if anybody who's ever done like any kind of stage combat or anything or any real like tr sword training you would never have a flailing hand that's how you lose a hand no. and that's why everybody loses hands in these movies because nobody goes it's definitely <laughs> right it's that's definitely... all you gotta do bud <laughs> Old school swashbuckling they're definitely trying to do like pirate movies where they're doing <laughs> that. um the thing we're like the thing where they're fighting we've got Yoda and Palpatine fighting. Yoda takes way too many falls for such a little guy. His little robe comes off, 
and he watches his little robe fall and he gets this look on his face after he watches his little robe fall where I always think that maybe he's thinking to himself, oh, golly whiz, I'm practically naked. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This whole thing ends in one of kind of funny's favorite things of all time. Yeah, one of the greatest in review moments um, was uh, Carboni, you you were a part of it, the whole Peter, when we when we realized the, the final oh, gasp of breath Peter. of yeah. Uncle Ben, right? The other moment that made us laugh that hard is Nick reenacting Yoda going through the weird little um the the vents when he's when he's dieharding around in the vents. Yeah, it's so fucking funny that Yoda is just beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, it's so good. You know, it's it's all part of the plan. He's calling to Bail Organa. Uh and then the Chancellor goes, wait. I sense Lord Vader is in danger. I got to go pick up my boy. I've invested too much in this boy. Uh, Yoda falls into, Yoda looks real tiny in Bail Organa's like space caddy or whatever he's got. He just looks so small and defeated. And he says, into exile, I must go. Failed, I have. And I got to tell you, Frank Oz puts so much fucking mustard on that line. Yeah, he does. On that one line, I feel everything. Yeah. Frank Oz kills it. We go back to Mustafar. They're swinging on ropes. They're going. They're Anakin's using a scared little droid head as a platform, which is how you know Anakin's dark side now. He would never use a droid as a platform before. Yeah. I like this bit where they're like really close in together and they don't have anywhere to go and they're fighting. Um, and then we get to, I have failed you, Anakin. I have failed you. And again, when you. Think of the prequels mm -hmm. as the Clone Wars show, and you see these brothers grow with each other, learn from each other. Where Obi Wan's last, and, and you watch this movie, and Obi Wan's last words to Anakin Skywalker were, "May the Force be with you. Mm -hmm. See you later, old friend." Mm -hmm. And you, Ewan McGregor, fucking nails he that does. because yeah. he's. He sees, he truly finally in that moment, I think, is actually taking in, this is no longer my brother. Yeah. This is goodbye, not old friend. This it's is, not even I'll see you again. It's goodbye, old friend. And you see Ooh. that kind of in the way that, and, you know, uh, good on Lucas for, you know, either helping Ewan McGregor get to this moment or, you know, letting Ewan McGregor do what he does in this moment where you mm -hmm. see it in his, his, his eyes, this realization of, I am not talking to that person anymore. Yeah. And you this feel a, it in his voice of, I have failed you. This mm -hmm. is a great, it's a great moment. Um, we do get to, you know, from the point of, from my point of view, the Jedi are evil. Look, yep. there's two sides. There are heroes on both sides. It says yeah. so right in the crawl. Um, <laughs> and then we get to, uh, it's over Anakin. I have the high ground. Now I will say mm. there's no precedent for this. Mm -mm. And, I don't understand <laughs> why it works, but maybe it's a, maybe it's a, uh, maybe it's, he's getting in his head. Maybe just by saying that he psychs him out. It makes sense. I don't I know. It makes sense, especially when you're dealing with lightsabers, trying to jump up at somebody and yeah. get anything done. Like, of course they'd be able to smack you down. We saw you're jumping dude. literally up from lava towards someone who's standing above you with a laser sword. Yeah. They can jump 20 feet in the air. They got another laser. I don't understand it, but fine. It's, it's, it's all still you got to do over him and he would be like, look, all yeah, you have to do is stand have jumped up higher than a just, Jedi and you we win. We saw him jump from this really big, long platform that was about to fall over a, uh, a thing of lava. We saw him jump like a lava a, waterfall. A there. lava waterfall. Yeah. We, we saw him jump like 60 feet to like escape right. that death over to the tiny robot head, right? He could have jumped very, away. Very perfect accuracy there. So I, I do understand of like, there's no rule. There's no, there's no, there yeah. wasn't anything in the first act where, you know, like Obi-Wan and Anakin are like, uh, Obi-Wan's like teaching a little bit of what he has yeah. left to teach Anakin. No, there's a we moment weren't, where he's we like, hey, told. you gotta, you gotta yes. like, we, si not we simply were not told. Road, Agreed. We simply, we simply were not yeah. told. Yeah. So um, when he jumps towards him, gets his legs cut off, this next part I think is cowardice from yeah. Obi-Wan, and I love it. You were the chosen one. You were supposed to bring balance to the Force, not destroy it. Uh, I hate you. 
<laughs> I love the I hate you. Yeah. Yeah. Because it gets into the yeah. I loved Mid you. Yeah. <laughs> like level of just like absolute comic camp villain that is. Fantastic, yeah. and something I didn't think Hayden Christensen would ever have had in him. Yeah, but so good. And the and the Clone Wars, the Clone Wars really makes this scene pop a little bit more. Um, it, it, Obi Wan puts Padme, who was choked for a few seconds and then thrown two feet to the ground, uh, into the ship. Well, because it, things are bad. Almost nine months pregnant. Things are bad, and yeah. um, Padme asks if Anakin is all right. Uh, we, get our, <laughs> we get our crispy buddy crawling out of the lava. Oh. The yep. emperor flies down to save him. And the thing that hits me weirdly is the sort of like tender hand the emperor lays on Anakin's little forehead, <laughs> his little crispy forehead. Yeah. Very out of character for the emperor. But I just love that little moment. It's like Voldemort when he hugs Malfoy. <laughs> and he's yeah. like, oh, come here. Come here. Uh, so... Bale lets Yoda know that Obi-Wan has made contact. Uh, we're, everything's going to be okay. This is where we start getting the parallel medical stories of Padme and Anakin as Anakin Bro, is being rebuilt. And she is Padme, all the way pregnant and her bump is this big with twins. She that, is about to give birth to twins and she is still the tiniest. It's twin goldfish. It's, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, this is weird. It's, Medically, she's completely healthy for reasons we can't explain. We're losing her. She's lost the will to live. And you know why they couldn't <laughs> medically explain it, Carboni? It's because the Emperor knows. And he's force killing her from across uh, the galaxy. Because how else would he know when Vader wakes up and he's like, where's Padme? Mm -hmm. And Palpatine's like, it seems like in your anger, you killed. How would he know that Padme actually died? Because he did it I would, himself. I would. I think that's worth considering, though we don't have anything in the movie that confirms it. Right. Uh, she literally just points at her babies and comes up with these names that have no significance in this franchise. They had three movies to ah! plant seeds. <laughs> they had three movies to plant seeds for these names as to why she named them that. So they had three movies to give them a chance to for them to talk about it. Well, what would we name our kids? I love these names. Literally anything. And instead, she's just like, Luke, Leia. <laughs> We're losing her. This. If she has to give birth now or we'll lose the twins as well. But yeah, she's having a fairly uncomplicated birth. She names the children just fine. I mean, look, I'm not going to say this is the best decision that's ever happened in a Star War. Um, it's, it's real weird. It's real weird. Is, is it the worst? I would like I'm to make sorry, a motion what, to say. What are we, what are we talking about specifically? The worst what? I, I, I think that Padme just fucking dying, giving I, up the will to live is actually the worst thing to happen in any Star Wars movie. If yeah, I remove, um, any of the issues of like, Racism, for instance, absolutely. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And yes. I know, yes. you know, yeah. and like, look, <laughs> I agree. There's a particular alien that was coded Jewish where I didn't like it, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... So we're going to look at racism and anti Semitism <laughs> yeah. uh, that exists within the movies. Yes, absolutely. Just as like straight up choices that were actively made. Uh, the crimes against my gender in this movie are the greatest offense to me in all of Star Wars, and they've made many crimes against my gender. <laughs> and, it, and it all gets wrapped up in this moment. Moment that I can only compare to when Talia al Ghul in The Dark Knight Rises, you know, runs her big vehicle off of the, you know, off of the thing and she's dying. She feels like her mission is accomplished, about to blow up Gotham. And I, I, Carboni, who's the actress's name who played Talia al Ghul? Because she's fantastic and I want to uh, uh, properly credit her because. Steve Perry. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> it's been so long since I've seen The Dark Knight Rises. Oh. The Dark Knight Rises didn't really didn't really gel with me as much as it gelled with some other people. No, uh, uh, Marion uh, Cotillard. Yeah, oh, uh, Marion Cotillard. Cotillard. Yes, Cotillard. Yeah, Thank Cotillard. you. I brushed that uh, so hard. No, it's it, it, she's French, I believe. <laughs> yeah, she's great. Fantastic actress, and she dies like this. <laughs> and that is yeah. the same exact death 
that Padme has in this movie, and I am convinced that Marianne <gasps> Cotillard watched this scene for inspiration. <laughs> um, yeah, as this is going on, we are cutting to Vader, who is who is just he's slapping at those medical droids. He is mm-hmm. not into this. He I hates do it. love this bra- this like m- Frankenstein's monster moment here. Mm-hmm. This like absolutely unbridled anger uh, coming out and breaking out of it. Frankenstein's monster was everything for me there. Yeah. Oh, it's so good that the one to one of that shot is so good with the with the uh, with the Boris Karloff Frankenstein. Um, Lord Vader, can you hear me? Where's Padme? Is she safe? Is she all right? It's it's odd to me in. It was weird in the Vader voice. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's always mm-hmm. hit me as strange in the Vader voice. I, it's it's because... weird that we don't get to hear Anakin say that before, like, the voice box gets turned on or something. Right. Because but it's, yeah. it's, 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 I don't know if his voice I works like, otherwise. I kind of like it. I know the no moment is a very, it's, it's not in execution a great moment, but I like, I the like I, it. I like the idea of because it's the Vader voice and almost how unsettling that is where he's like, where's Padme? Is Padme all right? Because we've never heard the Vader voice care about yeah. anybody, right? And I, I love, you know, I've always thought about- Oh, that's um, good. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, and I've always thought about like, it would have been a much powerful moment, right? If at the uh, at, at this scene, right, instead of getting on his knees and yelling no, he was silent Vader about him. You see him close his fist and Everything in that room is destroyed. But yeah. I do actually, that's what I've said for years rewatching this movie. But actually, now I'm thinking that's not who he is yet. Yeah. yeah. That's not. And we're going to, I think still, we're going to see yeah. that happen in the Kenobi show. B, yeah. And which then the Obi Wan decides one of you will be royalty and one of you will be poor. <laughs> yo, Good luck, kids. <laughs> this is, this is so wild. It's just like, yo, we can't let Vader raise them. He's not cool. He's going to raise them. And Bail Organa goes like, well, I'll take the girl. Cause we were going to pick up a girl on the way home. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, dude, like, yo, straight up real talk. Like, with all that, it's like, and again, beating the dead horse here, but it's like these prequels could have been so many things and instead of having Chewbacca meet Yoda they could have set up some type of story that made a little bit more sense of why Luke and Leia were separated the way that they were where they end up going all of that stuff I think I think when Yoda says it's best to separate them we are supposed to infer that if they're both in the same place they have a better chance of being destroyed they have a better chance of being taken by Vader and they also have a better chance of being sensed. noticed. Yeah. Yeah, sensed if there are two of them in one yeah, place. You, so that's what you, I always if, if from you it. if you have two kids together who are the child of one of the most strongest Jedi uh, around, right? Like a Palpy, uh, Palpy or Vader are yeah. going to like kind of feel it if they get close to, you know. It's like how the president and the vice president can't fly on the same plane. You don't yeah. want one lightsaber to take them both out at the same time. But I do think it sucks that one of them gets to has to literally be raised on a dirt farm that farms dirt. Yeah. And Which, the like, other one to gets keep to be his the evil pl- name though. And once <laughs> of them gets yeah. yeah. Well, how will we ever find Luke Skywalker? Uh, I don't know. Um, and, and, and I wonder, to- <laughs> and I wonder if they're making these decisions because it was always like again in the movie because it's never like actually talked about or said in the movie or set up. You know, I, I wonder if they're making these decisions under the assumption of like we think Annie is dead. You know, mm-hmm. so if anybody possibly knows about Padme being a lot or yeah. Padme being pregnant Let and it, actually having these kids, it might be yeah. this very powerful Sith Lord Palpatine. Um, but even still, like, why would you hide him with Anakin's in the same house. brotherhood? Like, yeah. brother in law? Literally yeah, in the what? same house with the same name. And once yeah. again, what? hopefully that Kenobi Shobi is going to tell us a little something about that. Um, and so. Obi Wan says, "I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go watch after him." And he goes, "Cool. You go do that because I have some training for you. There's Force ghosts, and you're gonna you're gonna learn how to talk to him, and you're gonna learn how to be one." And, uh, and there the, was a cut scene where uh, Yoda talks to the Qui Gon's ghost yeah. in this movie, and that, that's also included in the four hour super mm-hmm. super cut nice. where you just hear his voice. While Yoda's like has his eyes closed, and I freaked out because that also me reminded me of the the possibility of Qui Gon Jinn also showing up in this Kenobi show. Um, we get Padme's funeral. The somber Jar Jar is something. That's a shot. It I was is. like, oh that yeah, that different. actually hurts. Yeah, that hits. Um, different. Padme gets buried with the necklace from Anakin that she's still holding on to. Okay, um, and then 
we get a shot of Vader and Palpatine just like, we're going to build a Death Star even if it takes us 16 years. <laughs> it looks half done. <laughs> Don't you worry. In 16 years, that bad boy is going to be finished. Carboni, the work stalled. Yeah. The work stalled when once his face, the when yeah, one, yeah, once yeah. his face, uh, try to you know leave the That's empire. That's Rogue One. Yeah. Um, and then <sighs> we get to Obi Wan landing on Tatooine, handing a baby to Beru, and Beru's like walks up to Joel Kinnaman. <laughs> No words exchange. Did he hit her up on his cell phone ahead? He's like, hey, I got to drop off this kid. They walk up, they look at the sons, and they go, (laughs) we got a baby? (laughs) That is something. Yep. (laughs) Written and directed by George Lucas. And and I do want to say, the last thing I'll bring up in the super cut, because, yeah, very jarring moment. It's still a little jarring in the super cut. But what they decide to end on is not of the the moment of the possible new hope with Luke, right? Mm-hmm. They mm-hmm. decide to end on Vader finding the stormtrooper grave that Ahsoka left. And that's where they end in the supercut, which still hits even hard. It, it almost feels like that Empire Strikes Back of just like, you know there's hope, but you don't feel it whatsoever, which is kind of the opposite of what they ended with Revenge of the Sith in that last shot, yeah. which I thought was an interesting choice of like, you know, there's hope and it's going to be okay, which uh, tonally I felt like was a weird choice to have after this very tonally just really dark movie. It's a um, dark ending. It's, yeah. I think, I think no matter what they did, it's, a, it's a dark ending. And then it, it goes to the, dark ending. Did it, did it, did it. And it's like, yeah. uh, I don't know if I would have transitioned over to that music after the movie. We it was watched. originally going to end with the Cantina song. So I'm glad that they changed that. <laughs> Should have ended on Leia because the next film starts on Leia, but that's it. And there you go, everybody. This has been Star Wars Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith, our rewatch here on In Review. Like I said a million times, next week we're going to be back on the Kind of Funny Screencast doing our weekly reviews of Obi-Wan Kenobi. I am so, so excited. Episodes 1 and 2 will be next Friday, and then every other episode will be next Wednesday, I think, unless they stick to the Friday releases I'm sure at Celebration they're going to make that clear. But until then, Sage, where can people find you? You can find me everywhere on the internet at Not Sage and over on the Pixel Circus channel, which I run and also do a bunch of lovely shows with Anthony as well. Uh, we do D&D, we do morning gaming and pop culture news, and we got a bunch of fun new stuff coming out. So twitch.tv slash Pixel Circus. Hell yeah. And Anthony Carboni, where can people find you? You can find me everywhere on the internet at A Carboni, except for on Twitch where I'm at Anthony Carboni. Twitch, you cowards, give it back to me. I do the Pixel Circus thing with Sage. And uh, all next week, starting on Thursday, watch me on the Star Wars YouTube channel doing all of the Star Wars celebration coverage live. It's going to be a good year. Hell yeah. Congratulations on that. And congratulations on your first in review plot. You killed it. This was fantastic. Great episode, everybody. But until next time, I love you all. Goodbye.